Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just a few minutes late getting started, but uh, uh, just checking to make sure that everybody's here. Who wants to be here? Right. Okay. Okay, well, just while we wait for a few more people to arrive, uh, if there's anybody here who uh, has come to see the system integration presentation, uh, you're in the wrong room. So you'd have to make your way over to the, to the back to the main building. Sam. Oh, great. Yeah, I was, I was looking around the room just to see where you were. So, so, so you're the one who kicks off first. So, uh, yeah. Uh, have you have you checked the? Uh, I should actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did it look like there were many more people still to come across? Right. Okay. I'll give them another minute. Okay, folks, we're just about to start, so if you can take your seats as quickly as you can, get yourselves comfortable. So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session on uh, governance and regulation. Uh, it's quite interesting that in some of the earlier sessions, uh, the subject of uh, governance and regulation has al already been referenced to several times. So, uh, I'm expecting this session to stimulate quite a lot of discussion and questions. So I'm going to be quite strict with the speakers and try and limit them to a 10-minute presentation each, which will hopefully give us ample time um, in, in the latter part of the session to, to allow you, the audience, to ask the questions, to hear about the things that you want to know about. So we've got uh, four, four presentations for you in this session. Uh, the first, session, uh, the first um, presentation uh, is uh, about the, uh, the changing landscape of local energy governance in England. Uh, this presentation, uh, I'd like to invite Sam to come up now. Um, uh, this presentation will be given by uh, Sam, Sam Hampton. Uh, yeah, Sam is a, is a bit of a local fella. Uh, he's doing a, a postdoctoral research in, uh, looking at uh, energy and transport at Oxford University. Uh, he's recently finished his Ukirk uh, PhD, um, yeah, looking at um, energy and environmental governance for SMEs in the UK. Uh, he's currently working on uh, a couple of very interesting projects. Uh, which he may well mention in his presentation, uh, looking at the trial of uh, uh, on-street electric vehicle charging technologies and also a large-scale demonstration hybrid battery. I think that was also mentioned earlier this morning. So I see, I see your, your slides are up and running, so without further ado, over to you then, Sam. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that's right. I'm working on those two projects. It's called uh, Energy Superhub Oxford, which is the, the uh, bloody big battery. Um, and I also um, work uh, part-time for the uh, Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, and actually, that is the focus of my talk today. So um, the role of LEPs um, as in, uh, an increasingly important actor in local um, energy governance. So there are two parts. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of LEPs, if you're not already familiar. And then the second part, I'm going to talk about their energy strategies um, that Patrick Alcon um, mentioned earlier. Um, they've been working over the, on these for the last 12 or 18 months. Um, okay, so as you can see here, the, there are 38 LEPs. Um, they were initiated in around the beginning of this decade um, and re broadly replaced uh, regional development agencies, although not precisely in the timescales 
uh, weren't very smooth, so lots of people got other jobs. Um, and uh, yeah, so they, they, uh, the, the call was made by government to businesses and local authorities to come together and draw lines on a map um, which, with some kind of uh, economic logic. And now in some areas like Oxfordshire, it was, uh, in re they just kind of respected the uh, traditional county boundary, but in others you've got places like Enterprise N3, where they felt that that was a, 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 a logical economic area. Um, so they are, have 50-50 board memberships of local authorities and local businesses. How and who gets onto that board if you're a business is a, is a question for another day. Um, and it's fair to say that they were established and have a very clear <coughs> focus on economic growth. Um, so cutting a long story short, um, they have a, a very broad remit. For example, they handle the European Structural Investment Funds worth £17 billion in, in England. Um, and have all kinds of other influence in flood control and, and uh, lots of other things. But increasingly they are getting involved in energy and environment in quite a sporadic and varied way. So there was a benchmarking study uh, done a couple of years ago showing real <laughs> divergence. You know, some LEPs hadn't really mentioned environment or climate change at all, whereas others uh, taking, were taking a lead. Oxfordshire is considered one of those. Manchester is a leader. Um, and I think it's fair to say that a lot of that leadership came from where, where areas felt that there was economic growth potential in the low-carbon goods and services sector, um, and, uh, and, and that's what we saw. However, um, LEPs respond to national policy, and since uh, the industrial strategy and the associated clean growth strategy came along at the end of 2017, you've seen um, the concept of clean growth and, and environment and energy come uh, much more onto their uh, radar. And... Um, as Patrick indicated, um, some money has been given to all of the LEPs to develop an energy strategy. And I think it's interesting that that money was given to LEPs as opposed to local authorities um, or others or directly. So um, they, yeah, they've been working on that. Um, and that brings me to the small piece of work that I've done, just kind of reviewing the um, LEP strategies, as many as I could read. Lots of them are still not uh, published for various reasons. Um, and I was interested in three main uh, issues. So the stakeholder engagement, um, which they all had to do, were important to them. The uh, themes emerging and the strengths and weaknesses in these documents. Um, and I'm interested in the extent to which they acknowledge and appreciate um, the concept of climate change. So um, I think it's fair to say reading uh, the strategies and, and what they've released about the, the workshops that they held is that it's kind of the it was the usual suspects um, attending these workshops. So you had energy consultants, um, other land-based consultants, um, local authority officers very much uh, present, so usually kind of um, sustainability officers, energy people, but and some planners, although a lot of people said it would be nice if more planners came. Um, DNOs were there and people from universities. And I think there are, it's worth saying, you know, who, who, considering who wasn't there. So um, it, there was probably under-representation from community groups. Um, the construction industry, skills um, uh, actors were probably not feeding into these processes as much as uh, they might do, as much as we acknowledge that they are part of the energy transition. Um, I think Oxfordshire, I was involved in the steering group um, for the Oxfordshire one. I think we're a bit of an exception in the sense that we have, as you heard this morning, very strong... Um, uh, civil society groups like the um, uh, Low Carbon Hub and there were, uh, our steering group meetings did have quite a bit of dissenting voices. Um, they were quite tense at times um, with lots of people bringing up the, the topic of climate change. So um, themes, I think really 10 themes is too many, um, but um, it was a reflection of the fact that the, the, the strategies are really very broad. Um, so let me just quickly read them so you don't have to read them. So environment, cost, security and grid constraints, heat transport, supply and generation, access and equity, business growth, community energy and energy efficiency. Um, so let me just uh, skip onto the strengths and weaknesses. They, so as I said, the strategies are really different, um, so it's a bit crude to kind of um, draw out strengths and weaknesses. So for example, community energy I've put as a weakness, but actually if you read the Buckinghamshire strategy, it, it was really front and centre there, and um, they were interested in this idea of... Um, energy independence, you know, they, they, the LEP, it, it, um, someone mentioned this morning the idea that you know, a billion pounds is going, flowing out of the county, county um, it, uh, and we're importing uh, energy, and so that was considered something that they wanted to stop, and, and community ownership was the key uh, to solving that. Um, whereas in Cambridgeshire, 
didn't see the word community. They were much more about uh, low carbon technologies and, and emphasizing their science and technology strengths there. Um, so as you would imagine, business growth and, and you know, how are our SMEs and startups going to maximize the benefits from the energy transition was really the, the key theme in all of them. But you definitely had everyone acknowledge the, uh, the environment and the need to decarbonize the system and the Climate Change Act. Um, and interestingly, somewhat of a surprise to me that access and equity was pretty strong, perhaps a reflection of the fact that local authority officers um, were uh, influential here. And lots of talk of security um, and constraints and expansion, particularly in places like Oxfordshire, where we have huge growth ambitions in terms of housing and business. Uh, we have these plans to build up more than 100,000 homes in the next uh, 15 years in Oxfordshire, and that raises lots and lots of questions about grid capacity. Less so in kind of deindustrializing northern cities where the grid is is ample. Um, and and I think the weaknesses, are, it's fair to say that they reflect energy policy weaknesses more broadly. Um, so uh, heat um, was a difficult one. Lots of people tried to tackle it and, and talk about district heating and, and ambitions for like things like using um, water source heat pumps from the River Mersey and that, that kind of thing. Um, in fact, I interviewed one of the authors of, who wrote four of these reports, and he said, uh, decarbonising heat is a weakness, but this is because of the national policy situation. For instance, the national grid scenarios still have high levels of heat pump deployment, even though they know that in many areas the grid infrastructure is insufficient. Gov government is leaving so many op options on the table for decarbonising heat that it's hard to make a strong statement about direction at the local level. So that's important, and um, you know the degree to which uh, steering groups felt that this was a lobbying, an opportunity to lobby government varied. Um, and, and one example, so I, I brings me on to climate change, which I think, well, my personal observation is that you could read these documents and not think we are, I don't know, in, a, in looking at a, a graph like the one on the right, you know, a transformational change. Um, you, you know, they were, they, they were all about business opportunity and, and broadly doing more of the same, but, you know, decoupling economic growth. Um, and, but there were, so there was an interesting, Worcestershire was an interesting example where it was published just two weeks after the IPCC report in October last year. And they had this kind of section that looked very much like they'd added it in the last two weeks that was kind of saying, we are open to more ambition from uh, central government as and when it comes, but we're only Worcestershire. Um, so yeah, uh, I, that's, those are my themes, and I just want to leave you with some conclusions, which is to say that LEPs are a new and increasingly important actor in, the, uh, in our world, and we all need to be more aware of them. Um, they have a fundamental philosophy of economic growth and business support, um, so they, they are not neutral. Um, and it's definitely true that very few have any kind of expertise or background in energy environment, which uh, may not be a problem. They've outsourced these, but you know, without that experience, they do bring business. So there's a kind of slant that we need to um, that needs a bit more social scientific analysis. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the the fact that energy strategies have been given to LEPs reflects a, 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 the merger of DEC and BIS in central government. Previous to Bayes. Um, DEC had very little interaction with LEPs. You know, it was really just BIS and DCLG that they were um, interacting with. And so you could argue that LEPs are, you know, prior to the uh, clean growth strategy, they didn't really talk about the environment in, unless they felt that it was an advantage to them. So they are being pulled along by Bayes, which is a positive. Thank you very much. We have uh, one down from the front. Hi, Sam. It's Max from Edinburgh. Thanks very much. That's really great. I just wanted to, you touched a little bit on it in the last slide, but who actually wrote the report? So did LAPS consult, um, get consultants to do it? And yeah. So who were those? Um, and how was that? Did any LAPS write their own? No. No, not as far as I, I was aware. Some, um, like the Buckinghamshire one, actually preempted this whole move. So their one dates from 2015. Um, so that was the local authority that led on it with LEP input. Um, but more or less, no, they, they all got given 40 or 50,000 and they all just spent it on consultants. Yeah. <coughs> so that's why one person wrote Yeah, months. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that one was called Egni Dar. Consulting, um, they were, off the top of my head, there were lots of different ones. Um, yeah, that's the one I remember, I can't remember now. Yeah, thanks. 
was there another question there? Uh, if you'd just like to say who you are and who you work for. Yeah, Emma Jones from CAG Consultants, who didn't write any of the reports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just interested in your perspective of whether you feel that that has that affected the... Because that doesn't do anything really to add to their expertise, does it? When it's, it's, it's contracted out to consultants. You made a fortune from this. Um, so I was just interested in your perspective of whether you feel that that has that affected the... Because that doesn't do anything really to add to their expertise, does it? When it's, it's, it's contracted out to consultants. You made a fortune from this. Um, and, and did you see any... Um, are they doing anything to address that? Like, expertise? You've got expertise traditionally sitting in local authorities. They're declining, and now that role is kind of is there any support from local authorities or any other attempts to, to upskill themselves? Um, I think it's a really good question, and, and I think uh, I'm not sure nationally, but Oxfordshire is a very good case study because that, the consultants that were given all the money did a terrible job in Oxford, and actually, we did for that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, they were actually well, yeah, they were basically booted out after the first draft, um, and then it went to Oxfordshire County Council, who wrote the rest of it. In, with, with lots of the unpaid steering group. Um, and so, and in terms of secondments, yes, um, but more politics, more difficulties. There were lots of HR issues around, you know, if you work for a local, local authority, your pension is a lot better than if you work for LEPS. And so lots of the ones who got seconded and then two paid had, or two peed or whatever, has, uh, have now got different jobs because they would, you know, our LEP has found it extremely difficult to recruit full stop, let alone energy and environmental professionals. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Okay, so now we move on to our second presentation. Uh, sticking with the theme of uh, governance, um, and, uh, and, in, and in this sense, it's governance models to do with uh, low-carbon thermal networks. Uh, this is going to be a joint presentation um, from uh, uh, Michael and from, uh, from Trent. So I guess you, are you going to start, Michael? Uh, well, no, we'll we'll do it uh, jointly if you don't mind, Alan. Right. So, so we've got it uh, all figured out. Who's doing which page? Okay. Here. Okay. Well, what, what, whilst you uh, fiddle with the technology, I'll just uh, uh, give, give you a bit of an introduction. So Trent, in fact, gone back to the beginning again. I've uh, jumped somebody. I, I, I think I have to use it. So. <laughs> Trent has come to us from Vancouver. I believe you flew here yesterday. Yeah. So um, not too jet lagged. He's, he's looking more bushy eyed and bushy tailed than uh, than uh, quite a lot of other people I've seen today. Um, uh, uh, Trent has 25 years experience in this field, so we've definitely got an expert on our hands here. Uh, he's very uh, passionate about the interface between city buildings uh, and the en and energy development. So seeing that whole systems approach. So uh, well, rather than hear me waffle on about it, it's better to hear it from the experts themselves. So uh, over to you, over to you, Michael. Okay, come on, Trent. So come on up. I'm so, uh, very grateful to my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Trent, my collaborator, uh, collaborator Trent, uh, for coming over from Vancouver. Uh, we're not uh, academics, and so it's a slightly different uh, a change of pace, is that we're practitioners. Uh, we're the people that make it happen, social entrepreneurs and this, that, and the next thing. And, uh, but uh, I might uh, 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 hope that uh, this actually like, kicks out uh, some ideas for you as academics like pick up as research topics. Also, I think at, uh, in sort of uh, kicking off this, I ought to say that I noticed that there was quite a bit of an overlap with what uh, uh, previous presentations from Mags and Tim and Carla. So hopefully, you know, we'll uh, find some kind of useful debate out of that. Um, to kick off is that uh, uh, most probably um, you may be aware that the uh, Competition and Markets Authority last year conducted a, uh, uh, a study of the, uh, the heat networks market to find out um, if there was any uh, consumer detriment uh, uh, taking place. Glad to say that they did found that there was not, but uh, anecdotally, one of the things that sort of came out of it was that they were absolutely amazed at the, uh, uh, the, the, the range and uh, a number of different uh, business models that were being used. So, in a way, is that, that is what uh, we're uh, here to talk about. So, over to you, Trent. And Tim. <clears throat> Great. I guess uh, the title of this conference was uh, in a national and international context. So... Michael's the national, I'm bringing the international. <laughs> um, a lot of my job is translation um, in the sense I translate between disciplines and kind of work with public sector, private sector. So we'll try to do that as we go along here. Um, <clears throat> as a practitioner, I'm starting with the key messages. <laughs> so um, really quickly, um, you know, low carbon thermal networks, and in Canada we refer to them as thermal networks because increasingly they're combining heat and cooling. Um, and there is synergy and there are issues with both of those. So that's how we refer to them. But in urban areas, they're really an important tool for reducing GHG emissions at scale. Low carbon thermal networks 
whether they're publicly owned or privately owned, they're a form of public infrastructure. And that's a key message that we want to leave you with. Um, and that means that there's a role for public governance, policy, um, intervention, and so on. Um, no one size fits all uh, ownership and governance. We often use ownership and governance synonymously. They're not. But um, uh, I guess here I've learned the expression where you say uh, horses for courses. So horses for courses. Um, there's really no right business model, and I've worked on them all. But I will tell you, and the conversation we're not having, is there are bad examples of all of them and good examples of all of them. And that's a more interesting conversation to me as a practitioner, is if I have a client that wants to work on a publicly owned one, what makes a publicly owned network work um, or a partnership? Um, cost of capital allocation control are keys in governance. Um, we've already talked about design. Michael will talk a bit about pros and cons. Um, and then I just want to leave you with the message that ownership and business models can and should evolve over the course of a system. Okay, so uh, looking at uh, thermal networks, just to give you sort of a description of, uh, of what those are, is that uh, in a typical situation, uh, people are supplied from heat in their uh, homes by having a boiler in their homes. A, a heat network is essentially a, a, a centralised uh, heat production, uh, production, although it sort of somehow fits under the, uh, the banner of decentralised energy. It is centralised heat production, um, so you have uh, 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 it's completely agnostic in terms of the fuel or energy source so it can uh, take it from the ambient environment waste heat from buildings different fuels and technologies and this is one of the things that uh, uh, attracts government to it because uh, it's quite easy to flip from uh, one to another um, it requires a, a certain level of thermal density uh, diversity of loads different types of user types and and uh, critically, having an anchor customer uh, to actually uh, act as the cornerstone to getting it um, um, off the ground. Now, because of that, it is uh, most applicable in uh, uh, urban areas, high density areas, but those don't necessarily have to be big cities. They can be down to like village scale, provided it's got those kind of uh, uh, three aspects. <coughs> So yeah, so it. just really quickly, our approach, is we're going to present three case studies, just compare and contrast. But uh, Michael's really already described why thermal networks. This is more to see the conversation. I just would add a few things. Um, you know, they really are an important pathway to low carbon. I've worked primarily in an urban context, and I don't see many cities finding ways or pathways to achieve those. Just because the ratio of energy density to, uh, to needs is, is so high. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, on the continent anyway, there's a lot of discussion about the integration of heat network or thermal networks with other sectors. So integrating with electricity and microgrid, but also use of waste and, and so on. I've already talked about this, their public infrastructure in our view, and that's because they're a foundation of economic and social well-being, but they're very capital intensive, they're tied to place. And they provide both public and private benefits, and those have to be accounted for in the business model. So this is the overlap. I'll just present it, then Michael will talk, and then we'll present just a couple of case studies. But I think about it, and I'm saying simplified, because there's a number of ways. There's, uh, in the literature, a lot of talk about the degree of publicness and the degree of privateness. So this is a real simplification, because there's a number of attributes. But um, you can think of 100% public ownership all the way down to 100% private. And what I find interesting is the conversation often, often becomes those two poles, but most of my work is actually in what we call the hybrid models. And I won't go through all of them, <clears throat> but starting at the top are various forms of government ownership or local authorities. Um, and then in the middle on the hybrids, what we mean by that, they can be as simple as split assets where the private sector owns some asset, for example, heat generation, and the public sector owns the distribution asset. Um, joint ventures are when you collectively own both assets. Um, cooperatives are a form of uh, customer ownership. Very difficult to achieve, in my experience, in a capital-intensive in industry. But you do see them emerge, um, especially in the second wave. You have not-for-profit, so they're not cooperatives, but they get seed capital and they operate on a non-profit basis. The concession model, and there was a good question this morning about concession models and then private for profit. But I will point out, all of those have some form of public governance in them. 
Okay, so um, in terms of uh, making that choice, and this is once again kind of picking up on uh, some of the, uh, the earlier discussions, um, on the uh, left is we have that kind of access from 100% uh, um, public through to 100% private uh, with hybrids in the middle. Now, the choice of which particular model you, go, you, you choose is tied very closely to these three other um, um, axes. Uh, the first one is cost of capital. Now, uh, the public sector uh, can actually access a uh, uh, capital at 3.5% uh, through the Public Works Loan Board, whereas down at the other end is that uh, uh, the commercial sector is typically looking for a return of capital of around about 15%. Now, if you've got a project where the, uh, the technical and financial uh, evaluation is giving you uh, an, an internal rate of return of, uh, say, 8%, that means from the point of view of the commercial sector, it's not viable. Whereas from the, pro the point of view of the, of the uh, public sector, it is viable. So that in itself will actually like, rule in or rule out particular types of those, those business models. Um, closely uh, allied to that is risk because uh, these things are, are, are very kind of complex, uh, high risk, uh, high capital investment uh, uh, up front. And typically that is why that they're like driven by uh, public sector organisations, local authorities, university estates, housing associations, hospitals, what have you. These don't generally kind of come from the uh, uh, community sectors, so from approaching it from that particular perspective. But uh, uh, the risks, if you kind of get it all over into the private sector, those are transferred out. Whereas if, uh, if you're doing this internally in one of the uh, internal uh, SPVs or an internal department, that risk is retained. Um, and uh, uh, in respect of that is that the, the general rule of thumb is that the person who's actually uh, carrying that risk wants to have control of the project to be best able to manage it. So therefore, is that uh, the uh, element of control is uh, uh, closely linked to that. And from the perspective of the public sector, the, what they really want to control is generally what the, like, the heat rate is, the, uh, the rate or tariff, um, or the uh, expansion of the network. That's what they kind of uh, need the control for. Now, in practice, is that uh, you're not going to get a kind of a pure situation because all of these things are determined by local attitudes, uh, local viewpoints, and most probably there's going to be a mix um, of those things where people arrive at a decision about what's best for their locality. So I'll, I'll actually just skip forward. So a few detailed slides, we'll leave them to, to cover up. Um, I'll let Michael speak to this and then we'll present a case study. Okay, <clears throat> we short of time then. Okay, so um, one of the questions that uh, you know we, we we kind of debated about, and uh, you know I, I sort of uh, had this kind of viewpoint that um, uh, that local uh, community energy was sort of a, somehow uh, more virtuous. But then in actually sort of discussing it with Trent, is that he kind of pointed out uh, various things where it was a shortfall. So we sort of summarize, tried to like sort of uh, summarize it here, is that. Uh, you know, with kind of local is that you've got you're close to the customer uh, is the ability to kind of involve them in uh, in, in local governance um, you have you're aware of the click impact of investment decisions um, but on the other hand is that uh, uh, you actually uh, uh, suffer from uh, uh, the, the sort of scale in terms of kind of procurement, power trading, securing funding, and all of those things make uh, make the particular project vulnerable to system shock. Um, whereas on the other hand, is that uh, from a, a big energy point of view, is that they kind of uh, uh, they've got that which enables them to be more resilient to a, a system shock. But there's like a downside is that they are, are rem remote from customers, remote from investment uh, impacts. Bureaucratic, I kind of find, is that because they can divide it into different departments and you get turf wars between different departments and trying to make a decision. Carry a, he carry a heavy payroll. Um, and ha have a kind of problem with uh, local credibility. So the question is really, between these two, where is the sweet spot? Where is the ideal um, in this particular aspect? Okay, so moving on to kind of making this really concrete. And really what I want to do with the case study is present a framework for thinking about it. And so we're, we, we picked three examples, um, two from British Columbia and one here in the UK. Um, of different forms of ownership and a way of thinking about it. So the first one that I picked, uh, one of my projects was the Southeast Falls Creek Utility, which is a new utility that actually started with the Olympic Village in 2010. 
but I'm happy to say it's now expanded three times since 2010 and is an ongoing concern. And uh, this is the building, it won an architectural award, we can talk about that. It's a sewer heat system. One of the conversations um, that we've been having in this workshop is electrification of heat. And I always point out there's different ways to electrify heat. And heat networks are one means of electrification. What we've done is centralize the heat pump. And we achieve very high uh, COPs through a centralized approach. And we're able to minimize capital because we're diversifying the loads. So this now, this utility serves, instead of just the Olympic Village, it actually serves three large neighborhoods in central Vancouver. Um, so this is really the framework we want to present. I'll just focus for a second on it, then I'll present the second case study. When I think about ownership or, or uh, governance models, I think about a few things. I mean, ownership is only one point. Who owns the asset? The next question is, how is the asset owned? It, like, what form uh, it takes? So you can have a city department, which is what Southeast Falls Creek is, or a special purpose vehicle. Um, then the other thing, and I understand the terminology might be different here in the UK, but funding and financing, they're often confused. The way I think about it is financing is who gives you the capital. Is it 100% debt? Is there equity in it? Are there grants? Um, <clears throat> funding is how's that capital paid back? Does it come back from general tax revenues or through user rates? So Southeast Falls Creek was set up as a wholly owned uh, government department within the city of Vancouver. It's ring fenced, it's financed or it's funded 100% through user rates. There's no cross subsidies. They do have some external grants. It's 100% debt financing, but the city used a private sector financing model. So they actually charge a rate of return equivalent to the private sector, which in British Columbia is regulated. And it's interesting, you're talking about 15% IRRs. Our regulated IRR for a utility in British Columbia is around 7%, all in debt and equity, uh, post-tax. So it is possible to get low-cost capital, and I've never had trouble getting capital. The issue has been getting a system that they can fund. Um, but that's, uh, they chose to emulate that, so we charge the user 7% cost of capital. The governance is interesting. It's governed by council but they set up an independent rate panel. And that was to get some credibility with respect to setting rates because think about it, municipalities often offer services citywide like sewer and water. This is going to a single neighborhood and it's a new type of service that is normally offered by a more commercial entity. So they wanted to bring credibility to it by having an independent rate advisory panel of experts that advise council on setting rates. <clears throat> and then a few things I wanna say, there's a bunch of policies that enable the system. We have a service area met, uh, bylaw that requires connection. There's voluntary connections outside of that. They have to meet low carbon targets. Um, there's a price target and we have net metering within the system. But the two last things that I wanna leave you in thinking about all models is competition and evolution. So I often get, oh, they say this is mandatory connection so there's no competition. Well, that's not quite true. You can have competition in these business models, it's just upstream from the end user. So they have competition design, they have to tender, they don't do any construction internally, so they tender all that. And then at the periphery, we do have voluntary co uh, connections as a test of the business model. And then finally, from an evolutionary perspective, when we set up the utility, there's nothing like uh, an Olympic, de excuse me, Olympic deadline to get something done. Um, but we said, um, maybe the city doesn't want to own it permanently. So uh, they have a, an ownership review every five years, and it was set up specifically that it could be devolved. So really quickly, Michael will present um, another one from the UK, but... Um, I'm sure to you guys, yeah. we are running a bit short of time, yeah. so can I just ask you to move to the line? I'll just move. Um, so same thing, um, this was a split ownership model, and you'll get this in the in these uh, slides after, and we can talk about it. The only thing I wanted to highlight here, again, strong public governance, but they brought the private sector in to deliver. And then uh, Aberdeen. Okay, so uh, um, generally speaking, when you see these things, they're din uh, done in uh, um, uh, engineers' drawings. We've uh, converted this to a tube map so it can give you a, a feel for uh, what's uh, been happening. Is that um, uh, we started uh, um, uh, over here with Stockett Hill back in 2002 with just uh, um, a, a four blocks of flats and have expanded um, doing all these heat networks in different parts of the city. And the idea is that they will all be eventually connected together into a ring main. Um, that kind of little pink bit has been built, but uh, the blue green bit 
is uh, uh, Future and uh, the city, in uh, association with the county and Moray, are building an energy from waste plant in which we'll be able to take the, uh, the heat from that. So, so uh, uh, following uh, uh, Trent's approach is that this one is a company uh, limited by guarantee and uh, the ownership is uh, vested in uh, five members, one of whom is the city. And that's very kind of uh, important because that means that they are always in the minority. They are actually kind of reserved two seats on, uh, on, on the board. There's eight volunteer di directors. Um, the funding is that uh, the council has a capital program where it's actually refurbishing uh, 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 flats within their kind of uh, uh, their ownership, and they kind of ring fence the bit that they would spend on energy, and that that comes to us. Uh, we also benefited significantly from successive energy company obligation programs, uh, uh, Scots uh, low government loans, uh, grants, and we've also taken out commercial debt. Financing is that we, do, we, we are in fact providing contracting to the City Council, commercial and residential heat sales, connection charges, power sales to the grid, uh, we do private wire as well, and demand side response uh, uh, as well. As I mentioned, governance is through a, um, a board, um, is that we don't have like a policy for uh, refreshing that, but it does happen naturally through administration changes for the politicians and retirement for the people on the board. Um, and we're also subject to the ALIO review, which is an arm's length uh, external organisations, which the, uh, the council kind of keeps an eye on, gives us uh, feedback on how we're doing. Policies is that the absolute driver is providing affordable warmth. It's fuel poverty, and so uh, we have, have cost-reflective pricing, uh, but within that is that there is a reserves fund to enable, like, keep us going for a year should the shit hit the fan, or, uh, uh, and, and a sinking policy for replacement. Uh, we have a flat policy, uh, uh, a rate policy in respect of... Uh, um, it's very similar to what people were talking about earlier, about having, like, a mobile phone tariff that, rather than a kilowatt-hour uh, approach. Um, and uh, the policy is to try and set that below the fuel poverty level, 10% of uh, disposable income. We have a framework agreement with the council to deliver um, energy, uh, to deliver these projects within their buildings for the next uh, 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 40 years. And because like uh, uh, demand risk, the ability of having those people to connect is one of the significant risks, that like uh, removes that. And uh, um, we have this like strategic vision of the ring of fire, which I mentioned. Um, the evolutionary mechanisms are is that we can expand that beyond the residential sector, which was the original view. We've now got about 4,000 homes connected, but now like 25 uh, up to 30 uh, uh, other public buildings and have set up a wholly owned uh, for-profit subsidiary um, that actually like, engages with the commercial buildings to do that. And that uh, it protects our technical exemption in respect of our relationship with the city council. So it's got that kind of flexibility to be able to evolve going into the future. Sorry we're a bit late, Alan, but okay. that concludes our presentation. <laughs> So it's quite hard to squeeze uh, 50 years of experience into a 10-minute presentation, so uh, I'll forgive you on this occasion, but uh, the price will be um, a long discussion, I think, this evening <laughs> to cover on some of, the, some of the points you weren't able to cover. Uh, okay, any clarifying questions before we move on? You just explain tackle. Okay, so under um, uh, public sector procurement law is that uh, um, if the current council is like, seeking to take a supply from uh, um, in the market they would have to turn it. Um, however, is that if like organization that's providing it um, is acting as if it were an internal department of the uh, of, of the council, then it can invoke this thing called a techno exemption. So it doesn't have to be tendered. And that sort of uh, provides us with uh, a reduced complexity in terms of procurement and dealing with local authorities. Um, however, as uh, Trent says, that we do have kind of competition at a different level, so the design, build, operate, maintain, and some financing is that we kind of uh, competitively tender that, and it's got, that has got to comply with uh, public sector procurement technology. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so we'll now move on to our third presentation. Uh, third presentation. Uh, Continues the theme of local government. Uh, it's looking at sustainable energy capacities, scale, context, and materiality. 
Uh, this presentation will be given by Jess, Jess Britton. Uh, Jess, uh, you're a research fellow at the University of Exeter. Yes. So, uh, yeah. uh, Exeter is a, yeah, well, uh, South West is a, is a, is a well-known area of um, um, progress in terms of sustainable energy. And with all that lovely sunshine you get down in the, uh, down in the South West. Um, uh, I see you're currently part of the iGov project. Yes, so, I am. So you will actually hear a little bit more about the iGov project if you get up early enough for the 9 o'clock session tomorrow. So there'll be a bit more on that, I think, in, a, in more of a workshop environment. So I see that your slides are now up, uh, Jess, so I won't waffle on any more and hand over straight to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was going to be my first plug, actually, to say that my iGov colleagues have got the 9 a.m. session tomorrow. So I would recommend that as a way to shake, over, shake off a hangover if you happen to have it. Um, so today I'm talking about a paper that I've um, been working on with Caroline Kazemko. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here um, because of some uh, illness issues last minute, but it's paper working on that um, we hope to submit quite soon. So we're very open to kind of uh, comments on it uh, and queries, um, but it's specifically looking at uh, local authorities and the case studies uh, we looked at wall in England um, and their capacities in sustainable energy. Um, so, it kind of appeals to capacity and the capacity of local government, particularly in energy system change, are kind of made quite broadly, both in policy literature and in academic literature as well. But quite often, it's kind of framed in relation to this um, lack of capacity and used as this kind of uh, rationale for maybe action not meeting ambition, given that you know, a huge number of local authorities have got uh, significant ambitions in relation to climate and energy. Or kind of appeals to capacity are made in relation to how um, local authority capacity is shaped by national institutions. There's less work that seems to be specific about actually what do we mean by, by capacity? How can we start analysing capacity? Um, and how does capacity relate to other factors and things that are going on in the energy system? So that's what we wanted to look at. Um, and we worked to develop um, a typology of local government capacity and then link that to kind of wider contextual factors. And then we uh, applied that to some case studies, all of them in England. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about the case studies um, in this session, mostly because of time. So apologies if things are a little dry, but I will kind of refer to examples as we go through. Um, but uh, it's also based, those case studies are based partly on interviews, but also workshops and various events we've either, either attended or organised ourselves, particularly in relation to local authorities. So we kind of, through our data, worked to develop this uh, typology of capacities. And don't worry too much about all the information that's on here, because we will be returning to it as I um, talk over the next 10 minutes. But we start to think about, actually, how can you define capacity in a more detailed way? Uh, partly that relates to responsibilities, so that's around statutory duties and clearly demarked political responsibilities. And we define that quite separately from autonomy, so that's about local discretion to take decisions uh, and decide on policies. Uh, we then had a capacity type around uh, financial assets, so financial resources, but also ability to raise tax or access capital locally as well, as well as actual asset ownership. Um, personnel capacity, so numbers and quality of staff able to develop and implement strategies. Um, and we actually separated that slightly from uh, knowledge capacities as well, which might be in-house, but it's also about kind of that broader network of knowledge capacities as well. Um, and finally, capacity in relation to energy geographies. So um, proximity to actual resources, uh, existing low carbon energy assets, and also legacies as well, economic le legacies of high carbon assets or other local histories. But when thinking about those types of capacity, we also know that capacities are related to the context in which they're in at multiple scales as well. So we wanted to examine the factors that actually interrelate with capacities, what's driving capacities, what's driving shifts in capacities or limiting capacities. So we then spent um, a lot of time thinking about how, how it kind of relates to bigger uh, structural issues. Um, and we relate it to these kind of four areas of context. So national and global political economy, local political economies, energy and climate policy, 
across scales and material aspects of energy systems across scales. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about them uh, in detail now. So we will spend a bit of time on this uh, diagram. So the first one in terms of national and global political economies. I think it's well established that um, the national structures of governance, governance shape capacity in relation to energy. So whether that's a more centralised or federal governance structure does shape uh, particular types of capacity, particularly in relation to the responsibilities, autonomy and financial assets of local authorities to take action. So in this way, quite often local authorities are kind of framed, particularly in a centralised country like the UK, but are framed as kind of takers of global and national norms and rules and enablers of energy system change. Um, but we kind of argue that actually that's... Um, a more complicated and bi-directional, potentially, relationship. And we're seeing energy as potentially becoming an arena for political rescaling and more of a political issue at the local scale. So um, partly that's in relation to devolution and partly uh, austerity and um, financing issues as well. So obviously there's debate around devolution and the extent to which actually... Um, that is embedded and quite often it's based on this kind of national permissions to devolve but there was evidence within our case studies and more broadly in our work of a more kind of entrepreneurial approach to energy but also reframing energy as part of local economic development and social development so embedding it more into other um, local structures and we we see that and we've already talked about uh, Bristol City Leap prospectus Cornwall's approach to the uh, devolution deal and embedding energy within that, and also in West Midlands with Energy Capital, seeking to identify uh, innovation zones through their EIZ programme. We then looked at uh, local political economies and how that interacts with capacity in local authorities, and that's really um, particularly related, obviously, to uh, personnel and knowledge capacities within a local authority, financial assets, but also energy geographies. So this is around the ability of leaders to really mobilise energy as an area of fraction. And we heard some uh, really good examples of that in the first session this morning. Um, and there's a very strong relationship clearly between sustained leadership and uh, the presence of internal resources and capacity. Um, but we also saw that history and networks were important here. So um, whether that relates to the long history of Nottingham in being... Um, ambitious in relation to energy and climate and that you know providing momentum for the development things like Robin Hood energy uh, similarly in Bristol them uh, being located in an area where they've got a strong network of um, actors on climate and energy including NGOs industry and a well-established energy service team uh, but also wider networks so the work of UK 100 embedding that local leadership within local authorities that then enables these you know, personnel, knowledge, energy, geographies, capacities to um, develop within local areas. And then the third area was uh, around energy and climate policy across scales. Um, so that particularly relates to shaping responsibilities and autonomy at local level. And there was uh, quite a lot of consensus within our cases here about you know, this, this high level recognition within policy of a local authority role versus embedding a local role in policy and policy development and delivery. And that's, you know, there's a, a mismatch between those two things. Um, and also discussion of this um, two-way relationship that we've suggested not necessarily um, being widely embedded in England. You, you could argue that's starting to change. And we've already talked today about the development of the energy hubs, how the world of LEPs is starting to change. But... Um, the evidence from our, from our work with local authorities is the perception is that and that's not embedded currently. But at the same time, um, there was evidence of you know, higher level climate policy, say global uh, climate policy, being used locally to mobilise change. And you know, the, the very current example of that is around uh, climate emergencies and local authorities using that as a way to you know, reimagine their work on energy and climate and develop new partnerships um, and new ambitions. But I would also say that there was um, a huge amount of consistency in our findings around local action being undermined by national policy change. And, you know, I've put Birmingham Energy Savers there as an example, but we, we've touched on some other examples um, throughout today, whether that's FITS or low-carbon homes or onshore wind. Um, 
And then the final area um, was around material aspects of energy change, and that particularly shaping access to financial assets, personnel, knowledge, and energy geographies. And this was really, really where there was a huge amount of dynamism and change in capacities, partly because, as we know and we've talked about partly today, uh, the momentum in energy systems to more decentralised, uh, locally optimised energy systems automatically kind of promotes this more local thinking about, you know, what are our capacities in terms of knowledge, data, understanding, uh, particularly in relation to things like understanding uh, local future scenarios and opportunities. So that speaks really to some of the work that the ESC has been doing on uh, understanding local potential and local area energy planning. Um, but it also talks to the kind of material aspects of things like austerity and shrinking budgets as well. And there was this very strong theme with um, ambitious local authorities looking at how to identify trends in energy system change, so material trends around decentralisation and falling costs of technology, um, capitalise on those themselves, but then also think about how they can commercialise that. So public power solutions being an example of um, then offering their services as an um, arm's length organisation of Swindon Borough Council um, to other local authorities as well. Um, so what does this all tell us? First of all, uh, we kind of developed and presented this framework to try and help um, understand not just how local authority capacity is constrained. You know, there's a, an awful lot of debate around why it's difficult for local authorities to take action because of, you know, various financial and political dimensions. But also, we know there's a huge diversity of capacity and it's important to think about how that is being shaped by changes to political and material landscapes currently. Um, we also think that being specific about capacity reveals that some types of capacity are especially important. So our analysis said that, that um, knowledge and responsibilities were really two key areas of capacity. And that could suggest that, from a policy perspective, thinking about how we embed specialist staff and knowledge in local authorities could actually drive longer-term capacity in other areas. So whether that's uh, financial more autonomy or understanding of local uh, energy materialities and uh, possibilities. Um, we also thought it, it provides a way to start thinking about kind of some of the differences in action across uh, England it, for our analysis, but potentially more widely. This uh, image is taken from uh, Dan and Mags and Dave Hawkey's uh, work from a few years ago at looking at the variety in activity across local authorities. So although it's helpful to think about why activity might be constrained, and it's also helpful to think about the very ambitious leading local authorities, what that doesn't do is think about, OK, how do we enact policies to, to bring all areas up to the same level of change, given that we know every area is going to need a very localised transition, and local authorities um, are likely to play a very key role in that. Um, what that doesn't necessarily address is this kind of broader question about how we then develop the responsibilities and the duties of local authorities, and you know, perhaps we can talk about that um, during the discussion a little bit later on. But as I say, um, it's a paper that's about to be submitted, so any comments, uh, please do talk to me, or mine and Caroline's emails at the beginning of the presentation as well. So thank you. Okay, so I can maybe take uh, one or two questions on points of clarification. Uh, is that, I see a hand up over there. Yeah. John Cape from iPower. Uh, we certainly see exactly what you said about local services with ambition, but just not having the staff and no longer having the staff. Have you looked at examples, and I'm thinking of South End City Council, which has structured uh, energy projects such that uh, there's enough revenue coming back, um, but the revenue is used from energy projects to fund the maintenance of the energy team, so they're actually team, you know, there's a sufficient team in place there. Yeah, so that was absolutely the approach in some of our case studies, yeah. Um, and I think that would, that's kind of speaks to the point I made at the end around embedding the kind of skills and knowledge enables then the kind of financial autonomy to be built up um, and that the you know the two two are really closely linked but actually until you've got that kind of knowledge capacity within an authority it's very difficult for them to get into a place where they it's can develop self-sustaining projects yeah yeah 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we'll uh, thank you very much then, Jess. So I think it's now appropriate now for us to move on to our fourth and uh, final presentation. So last but not least, uh, we have uh, Ben, Ben Traffron. Uh, again, I think we continue a little bit of the international theme. Although Ben is from uh, uh, the UK, he's part of a team that also has strong links with, uh, uh, with Australia, with offices also in uh, Sydney. So the title of this presentation is uh, Contestability and Regulation of Local Energy Systems, Lessons from Australia. So, um, yeah. yeah. I think also looking at some of this as well, I think Ben has also had some experience working with Ofgem in terms of some of the Rio price controls. So I might need to talk to him about those later on as well. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, thank you. So you're here. So you, you, you probably see um, local energy as an opportunity to really reimagine uh, the energy system overall and get better outcomes for consumers. And regulation is key to that. Um, economists always complain that we don't really get sort of real life experiments. We sort of work on, on, on our computer or a piece of paper with some wonderful theories and, and see them get blown up in the real world. Um, what's nice about Australia is that it's a bit like a real world uh, experiment when it comes to the energy transition and issues around local energy. So, there are important lessons we can learn from Australia for uh, the kind of regulatory models that might work for local energy. That's what I was hoping to talk to you about today. Uh, now, I realise many of you will not be familiar with SEPA and our somewhat misleading name, uh, but we, we've been around for about 20 years now. We're an economic consultancy. Uh, we work basically in the interaction in the place, a space where private and uh, public issues interact. Uh, so a lot of work in, in uh, energy policy, a lot of work in, in transport, uh, and in, the, in their application in terms of regulation. And uh, as Alan mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're actually headquartered in London, but we do have a small office in Sydney. And what that allows for is for some really nice sort of cross pollination of ideas between. Uh, Australia and UK. So a couple of years ago, uh, we did a piece of work for the Australian Energy Market Commission, looking at uh, how you might uh, sort of flex the regulatory models that, that are used in Australia for different types of energy services, and that'll be the, the, the focus here. So as I said, uh, Australia really is at the forefront of the energy transition. It's got what's said to be the world's longest interconnected electricity system on the East Coast. But as you can see, lots of other uh, remote communities and individual networks. Uh, historically, the only way to get reliable power to those remote communities was through the grid. Um, as you can imagine, though, uh, having, having wires running across uh, thousands of kilometres to serve a small community is extremely expensive. <coughs> And there are all sorts of issues around security of supply in a country that faces both tropical storms and bushfires. So we have a huge potential for uh, sun and wind generation, and with batteries becoming uh, an increasingly uh, commercially viable option, standalone power systems are uh, a, a viable alternative in Australia increasingly, and, and the scope is massive. And that's reflected in the, in the types of uh, policy and regulatory reviews that have been seen in Australia in the last few years. And that's, that's kind of the, the starting point um, for this work. Now, just, just to be clear, for the rest of the presentation, when I say regulation, I'm talking about economic regulation <coughs> in the sense that we tend to think about in terms of things like the Rio model, so the way that the monopoly energy systems are regulated. Obviously, when it comes to local energy, there are lots of important other regulatory uh, considerations, as we've heard earlier in the session, uh, questions around um, uh, 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 so, uh, development rights, around security of supply, customer vulnerability, but the focus for the rest of the presentation is purely on uh, economic regulation. So what we've done is developed a uh, four-step uh, regulatory framework, oh, for, sorry, decision-making framework. And uh, very much one that's focused on the policy objective of minimising consumer harm from 
different market arrangements. And to do that, we looked at uh, what's been done in the UK, Australia, and a number of other countries in the energy sector, in telecoms, in transport, and we picked some common themes, some common approaches that can be synthesized into a cohesive framework that makes sense for Australia. And making sense for Australia means interacting with the, the current way in which decisions around regulatory models exist in Australia, which is all around service classification. So the uh, Australian Energy Regulator basically looks at the range of ser energy services that might be provided uh, and decides whether those uh, exhibit uh, natural monopoly characteristics and should be regulated, whether there's scope for negotiation or whether they should be open to competition. And in the latter case, there are various ring fencing arrangements that come into play to make sure that the monopolies don't uh, play in the market in a way that distorts the, uh, the competitive aspects of that market. So, so the framework very much needs to fit in with that. And importantly, it's about the uh, regulation of services rather than assets. Uh, and that's because we recognise that an asset, so for example, a uh, battery located behind the meter on a cons consumer's uh, premises could actually provide multiple energy services that, that might require different regulatory treatments. So I'll get, I'll get into the four steps of methodology and now uh, and, and then go into a bit more detail into each of the steps. I realise that this can be quite conceptual. So as I talk through it, what I'll do is also talk about how the framework might apply in the case of uh, considering microgrids as an alternative to existing grid supply. So the first step is to do with whether we can actually distinguish the, the particular service from other energy services. If we can do that, then we're concerned with any fundamental barriers to competition. If we haven't found any fundamental barriers to competition, we want to understand whether general competition protections are sufficient to prevent the types of consumer harms that we might be concerned about. And then lastly, we want to understand whether competition is really likely to result in, in greater benefits to consumers of regulation or whether some form of regulation is required. Now, hopefully, when you look at that, something that will jump up immediately to you is that the answer to all of this will change over time with technological changes, <coughs> with uh, different consumer preferences, with different political objectives. So it is important to revisit the framework or the, the assessment against the framework, I should say, uh, when something material changes. So the first step. Yeah. So the, the first step is really the fundamental step to all of this, and this is about whether we can distinguish the service from other energy services. That might sound really theoretical, but fundamentally, what it comes down to is: can we attribute the cost, attribute the costs of the service to individual consumers or groups of consumers? If we can't do that, that's really a dead end. Um, but if we can, then we can move on. In the case of a microgrid, hopefully it's pretty obvious that we can. There are physical boundaries to the microgrid, and that makes things much simpler. So then we're interested in understanding whether a, a competitive market can really emerge for the service. So looking from an economic perspective at the supply side, we're interested in questions around uh, economies of scope and scale, whether there are any significant coordination costs, any network effects in place, whether uh, there might be any uh, vertical integration issues that we need to, to worry about. And now on the demand side, we're interested in any countervailing biopower. So we want to understand the availability of substitutes. We want to understand whether there are any information asymmetries between the buyers and the sellers. We want to understand um, whether there are any whether well, there's any scope for the customers or their agents to actually negotiate with the, bar, with the seller. Uh, and importantly, we want to understand whether there are any significant switching or searching costs. You'd probably be aware that uh, one of the key arguments for why a competitive retail market in the UK energy has seemed to have failed, by some at least, is those significant uh, switching and searching costs. And then, the other important thing to think about, particularly with energy as a, an essential service, is whether there are any other barriers that would prevent 
uh, a, a market uh, uh, emerging. And in this case, so for example, with energy, uh, you know, only certain organizations are, are able to provide or, or sell energy, again, because of its view as, a, as an essential service. When we look at microgrids as an alternative to grid supply, the thing that jumps up as, as the biggest issue in this space is network charging. And in particular, at the moment, the lack of cost-reflective network charging. And what that means is that um, for a number of customers, they are effectively being cross-subsidized to be on the grid, and clearly a uh, microgrid or local energy solution would be less financially viable for them. But then there are other groups of customers who actually see going off-grid as an opportunity to avoid the sunk costs of the network that don't really reflect their own consumption. So that's a, that's a key point that we'll come back to later. So, so the next step for us is then to think about whether specific regulatory arrangements need, uh, are needed for the service or whether we'll be comfortable with the uh, general powers of competition, so the sort of things that are, that are in the uh, Competition Act of 98. So in the previous step, we would have identified the, the nature of the, the concern around market power or uh, any other type of, of consumer harm. And we can use the, um, the, the, sort of the, the existing evidence case law, in, in, in the case of UK competition uh, issues, to understand the likelihood and the implications of any enforcement action. The other point that's worth mentioning in this third step I did say that this is a, a purely economic regulation framework, but it is important when we think about uh, whether competition is, is really a viable way of providing a service to think about some key non-economic issues. So in the case of energy, uh, we'd want to think about consumer protection in particular. And in the case of microgrids, a key question is around consumer access to redress services, ombudsman services and the likes. So we've gone through all of that, and we've either decided that uh, competition could be viable or that some form of regulation is required. The last step is a cost-benefit analysis to either confirm that competition would result in the best outcome for consumers or identify the appropriate type of regulation. With economic regulation, clearly there's a, there's, there's a wide scope of types of, of models that could be applied, anything from the sort of full-on revenue caps that, that you get for the monopoly networks to a sort of uh, tendering or concession regime or, to, or lighter touch models that involve either negotiation or some kind of reporting and monitoring framework. So again, if we apply all of that to the case of a microgrid as an alternative to existing grid supply, as I mentioned earlier, the main concern currently in the UK is the, the lack of cost-reflective charging and whether that makes uh, a competitive market viable. Clearly, in the short term, that's unlikely to be the case and some form of regulation would be required. Exactly what that regulation is is really a function of the microgrid system that we're dealing with, the scale of the, the system, the administrative costs involved, the scope for efficiencies for different arrangements. So there isn't one size fits all. And as, you, as you're probably aware, um, Ofgem did recently launch a significant code review into network charging. So it's entirely possible that if we revisit this in a few years' time, the answer would be quite different. So just to wrap up, the, the, the framework here is, involves four sequential steps, distinguishing the service, understanding any fundamental barriers to competition, understanding the scope to use existing uh, competition powers, and then the CBA of, uh, of the, the service. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that, Ben. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, any points of clarification before we move on to the open session, uh, question session? Oh, yeah, uh, the gentleman. Okay, was there any uh, follow through in Australia decisions made on what sort of regulation if any to adopt for those um, private networks and so on? Yeah, so, so the, there hasn't been a single decision, but what's happened on the back of, of this 
piece of work is the um, organization that we uh, work for, the Australian Energy Market Commission, which sort of sits somewhere between where Bayes sits and where Austrian's policy team sits. So it's a, sort of, it's, it's a bit of overlap. It's a bit of a different system over there. Um, what they've done is launched a, 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 a really wide-reaching review into the, the types of regulatory frameworks that need to apply to, to standalone power systems. Um, and that's now at its second phase where they've basically uh, taken that project into two different work streams. So they're individually looking at uh, situations where, uh, on the one hand, the, the DNO equivalents or the, or the distribution networks there um, are actually offering standalone power systems as an alternative to either uh, expanding or replacing grid assets. And some, some of the issues around the fact that a um, monopoly business might be owning uh, services that need not necessarily be monopoly provided. So that's one work stream that's, on, that's still ongoing. I think they published a, uh, a consultation paper at the end of last year. And then they've got a second work stream that looks at uh, the, the scope for more sort of uh, competition-based arrangements in the case where standalone power systems are not provided by the, the incumbent distribution business. And again, they, they published a, a report on that recently. And there's quite a lot going on in Australia in terms of policy reviews, not just in the local energy space. Okay, well, I'm just looking at the time, and time is such a precious commodity, isn't it? This, this session is due to end at uh, ten past four, and it's about uh, nine minutes past now. So uh, it's pretty much the case that, uh, in my experience, that uh, presenters do actually prefer to present rather than being asked questions, and I think this session has probably been uh, no different for that. So uh, I don't think it's really worth bringing up the uh, speakers at the front to ask questions. We've only got, as I say, a minute or two left. But what I would suggest is I'm sure that the, uh, the speakers will be around um, for the rest of the conference, nab them in coffee breaks and uh, during the lunch breaks. Uh, I'll certainly be um, uh, trying to catch them uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. And uh, those I don't catch, I'll be sending them some emails with my long list of questions, which I've written down. Um, so uh, I think at this point, it uh, just remains for me just to, to ask you to thank our four presenters uh, for one final time for those very interesting and informative presentations. Okay, and just to confirm, I believe that the, the next session is due to start at, a, at about uh, in five minutes' time at quarter past, and I believe it will be in this room. So there's just enough time to take a quick comfort break for those who need it uh, in the expectation that the next session will be starting at quarter past.
in the interest of time, could I ask everyone to sit down, please? Thank you. Good old shout, never did any harm. Um, right, um, just in the interest of time, I'd like, we've got some fantastic speakers for this last session on the role of citizens in um, local energy, so I'd really like to give them um, time to speak and have plenty of time for questions. Um, so we are focusing in detail in this session on citizens, um, who they are, what they think, uh, what their role is in local energy. Um, and as I said, we've got some fantastic speakers. Um, we've got uh, Christina Dembski, who's a lecturer in, from the School of Psych Psychology at the University of Cardiff. And she'll be speaking to us about uh, all the work she's been doing on public values and what those values that people hold about the energy system mean for their engagement and, and their, their participation in local energy. Um, we've got James Oakletree, um, from, uh, who's a project manager with a low carbon hub, who's got, who have several name checks throughout the day. And um, so it'd be great to hear a bit more about what they, the work they do, um, working on community energy and com engaging citizens in community energy. Um, we've got Raji Nair, from, who's a senior, senior policy researcher from Citizens Advice, coming to talk about Citizens Advice and their work are on um, particularly generation and buying local energy. Um, and we've got Andrew Hunt, who's a strategy partnerships and policy manager at Oldham Council, talking about all the work Oldham Council's doing around community energy and uh, briefly touching on an EU project they've got um, um, on community energy. So uh, we'll start in the order we've got on the slide, which is Christina, James, Rajni and Andrew. And they'll give five minutes um, introduction and then we'll open it out to the floor for uh, questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was yeah. told to sit close to the microphone. <laughs> okay, so I um, thank you for having me. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the values and perceptions um, that might affect the development of uh, local energy systems, so from the public, perspe public perspective. And sort of the insights that I'm providing come from various research projects that I've been involved in to do with public engagement with energy transitions. And I've just included this slide here to kind of plug our latest reports. Well, one of them is relatively old by now, but these are the two UKIRK projects that we've been involved in, one on public uh, values towards energy system change, which is more broader, this idea about energy transitions, and then the more recent one around looking at paying for energy transitions. But generally, there's also other projects I've been involved in. So, for example, we've seen presentations on Restless, so this project on energy storage, for example. And I think in, in all of these projects, um, we often start from the point that people have sort of values and principles that they use to kind of work out whether they prefer something or don't like something or do like something or what they should think about some sort of new development. And we might think about like technologies, uh, like electric vehicles, energy storage batteries, renewable energy technologies, and so on, but also other things like different types of governance models, business models, d different ways to kind of uh, enable different services or practices. Um, and you can think of local sort of energy systems or local energy developments as one type of change that people might have to work out whether they kind of like the idea of it or want to get involved and so on. So I think I'm talking kind of from a point of view that I'm not, I'm, I haven't been involved in any research projects that look explicitly of, at energy communities and how they've come about and all of that stuff. I'm sure there's loads of um, experience in the room who can talk about that. But I'm talking more about sort of uh, the general public out there um, because actually local energy is very unfamiliar to the UK public. It's not something that's very widespread. Um, in other countries, this might be very different, but generally, you know, we've, we've got a very centralized system and people are very used to getting energy from the centralized system and it's just sort of the actors that are involved in that. Um, so I think we've been, uh, so from all the different projects that I've been involved in, we can kind of come up with some, some insights, some of the values and the principles that inform what people think about this idea of maybe getting involved, either owning, for example, their own energy gen generation, or getting involved in community energy projects, or this idea of having energy produced or managed at a more local level, whatever that might, that, that kind of form that might take. So uh, just going to come up with some sort of major highlights from what we found. Uh, start with, with the positives first. Um, so people really like the idea of it. So when they're presented with it, when they start thinking about it, when there's scenarios we, we present to people uh, that involve some sort of local energy scheme or uh, community ownership or even personal ownership, they really like it. And the reason why they like it is because it facilitates independence and self-sufficiency. And these are values or things that people evaluate as positive. Um, it kind of reduces reliance on sort of um, 
sort of national energy networks, and it, it feels empowering and sort of having some sort of control over your own energy use, especially if it's coupled with sort of smart systems and so on. Um, and it also coupled with um, this finding that people are relatively distrustful of big energy companies, which is, I guess, not that surprising, but this is something we cover in the, the Paying for Energy Transitions report in quite some detail. So kind of getting, getting some of that power back and not being so dependent on energy companies is a positive thing. Um, they also perceive co-benefits. I mean, they don't talk about it in terms of co-benefits, but people like the idea of maybe, for example, when getting involved in community energy, um, you know, getting a community feel, getting communities together, these are kind of positive things. But also things like uh, maybe there's opportunities to alleviate fuel poverty and so on. Um, and a kind of a third positive that comes up sometimes for some people is that it makes, or it, it appears to make energy more tangible and gets people more actively involved in their energy use. And people see this as a positive because they, they also perceive there to be a lot of waste around energy, both personally but also in the community or in the cities and so on. Um, but this is where I, I think some tension arises because there are people who want to be more active, and they think everyone should be more active, but there are also people who quite like being a bit more passive. So there are some concerns that people have that I think need to be considered whenever we develop local energy systems, and I think this is probably very familiar to people who are practicing, practitioners or are involved in these things. So one of the things is that some people are quite content with their existing systems, and they like the feeling of sort of um, convenience and the security that is provided by having sort of experts in, um, in charge or control of energy provision and, the facility and, and maintaining that system. And it's a valued service that people worry about losing if we change it to a more decentralized system. Um, there's also some concern that people express around competence, particularly um, whether householders, communities, or even municipal authorities have the competence to run uh, energy systems and the kinds of services that people are used to and, and rely on. Um, and I think this kind of relates to something that, um, this is the point that's, irrespective of whether the system is sort of centralized or more decentralized or, or some sort of hybrid of that, is that people, what, what comes up all the time is, is issues around justice and being able to make sure that the system is equitable and inclusive and making sure that uh, we don't leave behind certain types of vulnerable or disadvantaged groups. And this applies to community energy as well, or sort of local energy systems as well, because um, sometimes these types of schemes, particularly when you're kind of talking about this idea of a community scheme or a local scheme, um, they're kind of seen to be reserved for the privileged few, so people who have money, people who have the know-how, and people who have the time. So essentially, rich, retired engineers. So people get really worried about who's going to be involved in this, who can actually know what's going on and get involved. So this idea of community energy or local energy being m getting people more involved, there are some tensions there about who is going to get involved. Um, and then we come back to municipal authorities, for example, or local energy systems that are run by different types of groups might be a solution to that, but then people question whether they're competent to do that because they've never done it before, or at least they're not perceived to have done it before. So I think I'm just going to leave it there and just to say that you know, people are really positive about this and there's lots of positives, but in order to do this properly, I think we have to address some of these concerns mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. That's really um, interesting insights into how public values can shape what we do and, and also that there, there is diversity in how they're turned into perceptions and the tensions, particularly around justice. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, so, James, from the coalface of, of community energy and, and team engagement. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm James. Um, I apologise for my voice. It's slightly high pollen count today. Um, so... I'm a, I'm a former student at the University of Leeds and KT, kind of specialising where I could in community energy, and I have the privilege now to work uh, as a project manager at Low Carbon Hub. Um, I'm aware this is a mostly Oxford crowd, so probably some of you are aware of the hub and certainly of its actions, but I'll gloss over it kind of briefly. So the hub is an Oxford-based, uh, Oxfordshire, mostly Oxfordshire operating community energy organisation uh, as a community, in community interest company and community benefit society. Um, we currently have 27 community members um, that help to steer us and our objectives, and along with a 1,000 investor members, so local men members of the community and beyond, they have chosen to invest in us um, and work with us to help uh, proliferate community energy across the county. Um, and so the objective essentially is to power up our communities uh, via renewable decentralised energy production, uh, power them down uh, via energy efficiency measures or more permanent capacity uh, reductions, um, and help develop and engage with an energy system that 
uh, can bring everyone along for the ride, um, you know, that works for the people and the planet. Uh, so what that slightly long preamble, I hope, begins to show is that the hub's journey, its actions, uh, its, you know, its conception right to what it's doing now um, has had the capacity and privilege to engage in and be part of multiple forms of citizen reaction over the years. Um, you know, so whether it be on that individual level, so people who have chosen to invest and want to see um, kind of, you know, uh, renewable energy in their local communities, working for their local communities, um, whether it be you know, people in, uh, with the schools and businesses we work with that have chosen that they want that school and business to lead on climate change, to lead on local energy, um, they've to taken to take that next step of an action and that next step of engagement. Um, and then, of course, you know, up, to, up to that level of groups, you know, bands of citizens working together and coming together to enact you know, more active change and you know, potentially you know, disruptive or effectual change on the energy system. You know, uh, again, getting involved in decentralized renewables, uh, going around and forming local populists, working on energy efficiency, providing tools and uh, materials for the local community to decarbonize and use their energy better. Um, and what I think, the reason that has been so successful in the growth of the hub and the community energy in Oxfordshire um, and, and around the country is because that engagement can show very tangible change, very easy to see change in your local community. You can see the solar panels that you invested in or your community group held to pay for or that you worked for or that you engaged in any, any form there. You can hopefully, you can talk to your neighbours. Your neighbours will feed back on the fact that they gave, they got great advice on how to potentially change their energy supplier or look for different suppliers or maybe getting their own panel set up or any other, you know, engagement with the energy system or decarbonising their energy use. Um, and I, yeah, and I, so I, and I think it, it's it's those it's those benefits that are are so tangible um, and that make that engagement so easy and hopefully engagement besets engagement. Um, and I don't think it's just you know the the economics to a degree you know although that's helpful you know revenue streams that weren't there before for community groups that they can now access and potentially you know change besets change. Um, but also you know maybe the this, the social links as well and I think it's something Christina alluded to a bit but you know. Are we, you know, does community energy allow us to have connections and interactions in a community that we wouldn't if that community energy organisation didn't exist or that drive to, you know, use energy better and the, and the groups around that didn't exist? You know, are we empowering, you know, people to be able to engage with their energy system better, although potentially they might, may not want to? Again, as kind of Christine alluded to. And, and, um, and I, th I think that's, that's, you know, that, that's hugely valuable and hugely important and shows the drivers for why people get engaged. Um, and there's absolutely barriers to that engagement. We know there are. Um, you know, on the individual level, uh, you know, whether we have you know, time, resources, money, capacity, um, all of those levels. And then, of course, with group engagement, you know, we're looking at, again, maybe access to funding or ability to access revenue streams, expertise potentially, but I think maybe expertise can, you know, can not just be a matter of do you have all the specialists in that group, but do you know where to go to get better information? Do you have access to that information? Do you have access to make up for that dearth of expertise? And that's something that you know, we focus on uh, to a large degree. Um, and so although I see I'm running out of time quickly, um, you know, certainly I think so. Uh, the loss of the feed-in tariff as well potentially is something there in terms of accessing revenue streams. And although I'm sure we talked today about business models coming online that will be able to facilitate that loss of revenue, that revenue still may be risky. We may have to overcome that risk um, and find revenue streams that aren't as risky, and that could increase the transactional costs as well. You know, we don't have a 20-year RPI-linked perfect, you know, kilowatt hour rate that's going to help these projects move forward. And how do we overcome that? Uh, so despite the drops and chops in the feed-in tariff, despite the you know difficulties of engagement, we are seeing greater um, citizens' reaction. And I think that action, again, as I mentioned, can beset further action. Whether it can bring consumers along for the ride and bring a whole community forward. I don't know. I'm sure there are smarter people in this room that would be able to discuss that and bring that further forward, but that's potentially a question to discuss further on. Um, but I think, yeah, community energy and community action that is built by it uh, needs to play a part, is playing a part, and can play a part, because we need to ensure we're bringing as many people along for the ride, and we're listening to that concern, and we're listening to that, um, you know, uh, issues that we may have with it, because those communities are already living in a world where there is decentralised renewables around, there is energy efficiency going on, and what are their, how would they like to utilise that slow build-up of, you know, what we'd like to see is a decentralised local energy system moving around them. So thank you. Yes, just under time. <laughs> a really interesting view on the spectrum of forms of engagement through individual to community and, and the, the, the provi providing tangible change, um, but also less tangible outcomes like social outcomes. So I think that's really good to have a reminder of that. Um, and Rajni, the view from Citizens Advice. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so hello everyone, I'm Regney from Citizens Advice. Um, so a bit of an obvious statement from me to start off with, um, but the energy system as it changes from this sort of top-down approach to a more decentralised system one will most likely have profound effects on, on consumers and citizens. So it, it, won't, it not only dictates how people might use the system, but the opportunities and risks of, uh, available to them, as well as fairness and transparency uh, with the G, within the GB market. Um, so the energy consumer and citizens will likely play a role in local energy, uh, whether that's through generating, selling or buying energy, or being flexible in how they do those things. So at Citizens Advice, because we're the statutory representative for um, energy consumers, um, we have expertise in almost every way that a consumer might engage with the energy market. That's right um, from energy networks to, to the retail market through to energy-related technologies that they buy. Um, and our research indicates that some people have an appetite to generate and buy energy at a local level. Um, so some forthcoming research uh, puts concepts like peer-to-peer -peer energy trading um, ahead of many other potential market models in terms of consumer acceptance and likability. Um, but our consumer contacts data also paints a picture of the types of problems people are already coming across right now as they choose to generate energy. Um, so in the first two quarters of 2018, we had over a 1,000 contacts relating to solar PVs. And one of the most common types of complaints relate to um, uh, solar PVs uh, related to product performance, uh, where products fell short of the estimated performance installers had suggested. Um, and that's not uh, it's not uncommon for mis-selling to be a complaint with other types of renewable technologies, such as uh, battery storage. Um, so the role of energy consumers in a local energy system will depend on how much confidence both consumers and investors are given in the market and how people can <coughs> accurately understand the value of engaging. Um, so we're doing some research at the moment right uh, now to uh, look at how best to explain the value of smart home products, so smart battery storage, smart appliances, etc., etc., which could enable much of the local energy future but it's likely that consumers will need other tools and protections to help them make the right decisions. Um, and we know that for some, complexity is a crucial barrier that risks disengagement. And that will also play a role in, in how um, consumers participate in the future. Um, so we see community energies as a, a potential to play a role in reducing that complexity and unlocking the value for consumers as the energy system changes. But our recent report into community energy groups finds that whilst consumers are generally really positive about their experience, there isn't always enough hard evidence on the cost savings or the tangible benefits. I think that was mentioned earlier on um, in the conference. Um, and there were also some problems related to information pr provision. Now, consumers were generally willing to overlook those problems, but it's not necessarily sustainable if the sector is to grow. Um, in the future. So fundamentally, we would like to see a fully developed incentives framework for those who generate energy at a distributed and local en level. So this means consumers and communities should be paid for the energy that they make, but the, and the payment should be reflective of the benefit it has to society. Um, for an export tariff to work, it must be cost effective for, uh, for people and must not create perverse incentives in the market. Um, so the Smart Export Guarantee, uh, which the government announced <coughs> earlier last, uh, I think it was like late last year, sorry, um, is, is welcome to fill that policy void, but the aforementioned issues that we uh, have just said need to be considered in more detail. Um, if flexibility markets are developed at a, at a local level, consumers could play another role in when and how they use energy to benefit the grid um, and our generation capabilities. These opportunities are dependent on what the market offers and how it can translate value to people. We want to see robust protections for consumers when they do engage, and this is something that Ofgem needs to look at when and if they choose to review their current regulatory framework. Finally, um, I'd just like to briefly touch on um, the decarbonisation of heat, um, which may well become a local energy <coughs> issue. 
So I think this was also mentioned um, during the co uh, conference already. Um, but the necessary changes to the, the system will be significant and decision makers will need to engage consumers and citizens as that transition happens. Um, and so it's really imperative that you have the right skills and resources at local level um, as the system changes um, and shifts fundamentally. And whatever um, vector is used for heating, um, consumers should have the same outcomes um, regardless. Thank you. A reminder there of the, sort of the profound implications of, of, of local energy across the, the, the gamut of, of parts of the energy sector um, and, and the importance of fairness and transparency um, during that process of change, but also the real challenge of complexity for, for citizen engagement and the need for, for customer protection across the whole gamut of, of systems. Thank you. Um, and, and last but not least um, is, is Andy Hunt from Old Dunn Council talking about his experiences of, of community energy at the local authority scale. Okay, thanks, Katie. So um, <coughs> I work for Oldham Council. Um, we, um, as Katie mentioned, we do run a, um, an EU-funded project called Coalesce. Now I've got uh, 10 minutes in the poster session later on so that, to talk about that. So that's twice as long as I've got here. <laughs> so I'll leave that to then. Um, but um, I'll tell you a, a brief story about um, our local community energy group, Oldham Community Power. So earlier on today, you know, we heard some really inspiring stories from, um, from Oxford and Bristol, you know, two relatively wealthy areas of the country. Um, Oldham is a completely different story. We're one of the most uh, deprived boroughs in the country, you know, a very small council, very, uh, you know, uh, poorly funded, really. Um, but we decided um, a few years back, 2016, that we wanted to support our local community energy group, Oldham Community Power. So um, we selected a few of our buildings for them to install solar PV on. So there's a few schools, community centres, that sort of thing. <laughs> Um, we came up with a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of potential projects, um, one worth about £380,000 and then a, like a stretch target, um, which is about £670,000. And we thought, well, you know, see how well they do in raising, you know, money via their share issue. Now, at the time, um, it was the feed-in tariff and um, Oldham Community Power had uh, feed-in tariff deadlines to meet if their business model was going to add up. So, um, you know, they, they uh, launched a share offer and they thought, well, you know, we'll go for the £380,000 scheme first of all, you know, and see if we can get that. Um, and uh, they had six weeks to raise the money. Um, and after about four weeks, um, they had managed to raise about £20,000. Now, um, as a council, we did struggle to get the sites in the first place. The schools were quite suspicious of the, uh, the business model. Um, they, they, the you know, struggle to actually understand it. You'll be getting discount electricity, not free electricity. You'll have to pay Oldham Community Power. But we did get them on board. Um, but when we realised that Oldham Community Power weren't actually going to be able to raise anything like the amount of money, um, you know, we, we, we sat down with them and they said, well, what's happened? And they said, well, you know, we've been out there talking to people and, um, you know, people just don't seem familiar with the concept of community energy. You know, um, one of the directors had um, a resident say to him, look, this is Oldham, you know, you give us money, not the other way around, you know. <laughs> you're trying to, so what you, so you're selling us shares in something, what's this, you know, we can't see any solar panels. And another resident complained to the police that it was a scam and the guy phoned me up and he's, he's like, it's, it's, I just can't get the police to take any notice. And I said, well, that's because it's a genuine scheme. Oh, right, well, we haven't seen it advertised well. It's been in the papers. Well, you, sh you know, you should have put it on Granada Reports because that's all we watch in this house. Anyway. <laughs> it was a struggle, to say the least. So, um, <clears throat> so the, what the council, what we decided to do, we said, right, okay, we've got this feed-in tariff deadline to meet. So we, the council, will lend you Oldham Community Power like £250,000. We whittled down the scheme to a basic scheme that would be viable. We lent them £250,000 and what we said was, look, you go and build it out, put, install the solar panels and then um, run another share offer and see if you can refinance it to the community. And that's what they did. So um, we managed to meet the feeding tariff deadline with this scheme. Um, Afterwards, Oldham Community Power, they went out with a completely different approach. Then they could actually say, instead of, look, we're trying to raise money to do a scheme, they said, look, the solar panels on this school, you know, we've put them on. 
Um, and um, you know, now we're selling shares in this, and you, you can buy a share of it as a resident. And um, you know, the only problem we've got is at the minute the council owns the shares, so it's the council getting the benefit. So we don't want that. We want the community get to get the benefit. And they had a lot more success. And um, <laughs> surprisingly, you know, I was, you know, anyway, I don't know about the reputation of the council, but um, but they had a lot more success. And um, the, the loan that we gave them was over two years, and what we said was that at the end of the two years, any, uh, any loan that wasn't repaid would just convert it into normal shares so that the council would end up as a shareholder, like a, a backstop, if you like, if I could use that word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oldham Community Power managed to raise, in the end, £150,000, um, which, for Oldham, we consider to be a huge success. Um, you know, one of the poorest boroughs in the country, and um, now, um, you know, three years on, we're now talking to Oldham Community Power about potentially doing a phase two. Um, the council can't have a bigger shareholding. We've got £100,000, but uh, we've got some of our strategic partners, you know, the police, fire... Uh, some of our key partners in the borough are interested in backing the scheme in the same way. And we're hoping that, um, you know, we're, we're going to, um, again, become the biggest community energy scheme in Greater Manchester, which we did, we did have that crown for a while. But when I tell this, this tale, what I always say at the end of it is, look, if we can do it in Oldham, anybody can do it. Thank you. Thank you to our panellists for such a broad view on, on, on this topic. Um, I'm going to um, wander over to the, 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 the rostrum and open it out for speakers. We've got two roving mics, so I will take um, three questions at a time and pose it to the whole panel. Um, a raft of hands going up there. I've, watched, I've read too much research on the skew of people asking questions and the response following questions. Um, I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else wants to ask a question? Okay, right. Um, if we start with the, the two gentlemen here and uh, the gentleman here, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Um, uh, uh, Ian Cairns, um, uh, working on the research project for, for UKIRK Finance and Community Energy, and I'm at Strathclyde University. Um, if we look at other countries that have uh, advanced sort of community energy most effectively, they, they tend to do it through a, a combination of different things. So if you're thinking about Denmark, perhaps, then it used a combination of a feed-in feed tariff and then local... Um, rules which said that ownership has to come within a, a certain area and then more sort of public ownership of like, the, the, the energy infrastructure and, and various kind of ways. And, and, and my question is, to, to what extent would um, this be able to be, the, these kind of results be able to be achieved within the UK without that type of uh, support? Thank you. And the gentleman in front. Uh, John Cape for my power. Um, the, i have had earlier on today a discussion of um, Ofgem with its strategic charging review, which, um, I mean, Ofgem's brief does centre on the concept of fairness, and fairness has several different tangents to it, in that, on the one hand, they can think we don't want a lot of poor customers stuck on the end of uh, a stranded asset network because everyone else is doing fancy things and, you know, low-income people aren't, and therefore, you know, they get charged a fortune, so... Um, they have a charging review which can be seen as constraining on new energy models. On, on the other hand, fairness can mean, in an economic sense, that um, you know, economic costs should be um, transparently charged in relation to the actual economic costs of that service provision. Um, and those are two sort of countervailing concepts of fairness. Uh, I suppose the first question is, any comments from the panel, anyone, how that will or should play out, but whether there's been any, any research on customer attitudes to, to fairness as we new, move into this new um, energy transition. Thank you. And a final question down in the front. Yeah. Hi, yeah, Donald uh, Brown from the University of Leeds. Um, slightly provocative one, I uh, hope not too provocative. I remember uh, sitting uh, through a presentation that Emma Bridge gave about uh, a year ago or something around the kind of size of the community energy space. I think it was around 165, 170 megawatt peak. Um, 
I meet people, I'm on a European project uh, where I meet people who see the UK as a real kind of great case of community energy and we've done lots of great things with the feed-in tariff. Um, given that, that the kind of scale of, of what community energy has been able to do versus its sort of visibility and, and, and um, tool as a kind of advocate for this uh, with, with citizens and communities, do we see... As do we see community energy as actually being about delivering volume or is it about changing the national conversation around energy as being the main impact that it might have? Thank you. Um, and I'll give each panellist a chance to respond to as many or as few of those questions as they like. So <coughs> broadly around sort of finance and ownership rules, how are we going to manage without um, either controls on, on ownership or, or uh, additional finance through things like feeding tariff? Uh, the impact of the strategy charging review and particularly around fairness and, and uh, the impact on business models. And um, is it all about scale or is it about changing the conversation around energy? So just because you're next to me, could we start with you, Raj? Sure. Um, so on uh, how we can manage without fits um, and other sort of um, support mechanisms, um, I guess it's, it's about sensing the opportunities at a local level um, and where the value could be derived. And I think flexibility markets is one of those markets where uh, value could be derived um, and there is a real role for um, uh, community energy um, or potential role for community energy. I think the other part of that is um, as we transition, um, and, and yesterday I think Laura Sanders used the word transformation as opposed to a transition um, because it is a, a big transformation. Um, as we transform um, the energy um, system, how do we support consumers um, and citizens um, and ensure that everyone is brought along? And so I see, I see a role there for um, community energy, definitely. So it is about um, identifying the right models and the right needs um, and identifying the right value streams. Mm. Um, in terms of consumer attitudes to fairness, um, I know um, there has been some work done around fairness and energy justice. Um, I'm not particularly aware of any um, consumer research um, in terms of actually asking them, um, although the work that um, uh, Oxford's council might be doing um, on uh, uh, trying to hear from citizens themselves might go a long way in... Um, uh, helping to identify fairness. In terms of delivery volume or changing the national conversation, what, what's the role for um, community energy? Um, I'd say it was, it's more around changing the national conversation for me. Um, I think our role at Citizens Advice is more to ensure that um, every consumer is protected and the, the market is fair for everyone. And I think um, community energy definitely has a role to play in changing that conversation and changing how we interact with consumers and the support that they get and it often it has um, quite a, a lot of impact in terms of a social impact as well um, so, so for me it's about changing the national conversation I think um, volume is quite difficult because it often relies on um, having the right resources and skills immediately and that's not always the case for certain community energy groups. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to touch briefly on the actually the fairness point is a really interesting one, um, and actually we we've got a paper under review at the moment which looks at different sort of the way people talk about fairness when we talk to them about different types of energy futures, particularly looking at energy storage solutions. And there's a tension there because there's definitely this conversation about vulnerable groups and not leaving people behind. And it might not be talked about in terms of stranded assets and all of that stuff, but certainly in terms of developing changes or technologies in a way that allow everyone to be included, whatever that means. And they're different needs because everyone has different needs and recognizing those needs. But there was another type of discourse which is very different, which is if you're going to invest in these technologies, people should see a return, and it would be unfair to ask people to invest in these new technologies without getting anything back. And those two discourses do not sit comfortably next to each other. So there's a tension there, and I think you could probably, I mean, this was qualitative research, so I wouldn't be, feel comfortable saying, you know, there's this many people that think this, and this many people this, and some people are ambivalent, and so on. But I think there's certainly people who fall on either side of that, but there's certainly people who believe both. And, and this, it's up to us, I don't know, 
all of us to work out where, where we make that work. So I think it's an interesting, the whole fairness issue is a really interesting thing. It has so many different angles. And I, I do think also that people are very, they're sort of certainly aware of it when they start deliberating about these, these ideas. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about uh, community energy, uh, which I guess is one form of local energy, there's different types, there's different forms, but um, I agree it's probably not just about scale, um, but I do very much believe, I'm a big advocate of we need a better national conversations about energy transitions or where we're going and energy futures, because when these things happen, like local energy projects get introduced or people start talking about them or, you know, we are told you're going to have a smart meter in your home, people don't know where to place that. Mm -hmm. And there isn't really a big national conversation. And I guess maybe sort of this, this, this you know, making energy more local could be a hook into that. So I, I do think it should be more about advocating or changing the national conversation, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think there's too much more that I would disagree with and maybe not try to cover there. But I mean, certainly, um, although we talked a bit about the fit, you also mentioned kind of a, a, a need for local ownership of the system in Denmark. Um, I mean, that could be a concern. We could build a market, we could build a system which is able to you know, value flexibility, demand, local decentralized generation. And then we see a huge expansion in those markets with large companies buying up huge swathes of roof space and being able to you know, benefit from these added revenue streams. Um, how, I, I don't know, but how do we prevent that? Do we need to you know, say we need X amount of local, of local ownership? Do we need to you know, find a way to, to conduct that? Because that has a capacity. It almost happened, I think, with um, Ofgen were I think, picketed by a number of um, uh, large or what well, large-ish, maybe not in the sense of this room, uh, uh, producers that wanted to move some of the capacity from the remaining feeding tariff into the larger band because it had hit its cap. How do we stop that from occurring at multiple points down the line with new revenue streams or new forms of funding? So that's maybe a conversation that we need to have in terms of that local ownership, not just those funding streams. Um, I think there's not much more I can add in on the fairness argument there. I think you guys have absolutely covered that. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, and I think, in, yeah, in the role of community energy, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it, 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 has, it has reached a, a kind of substantial size. I hope it continues to, to proliferate. But my limited understanding is thus far it's been, it has been an influencer, it's been a, a demonstrator, it's been a kind of a look, look what we can achieve. Um, and maybe it will continue to be that. Maybe it, it, maybe, it, maybe it should only continue to be that, and we need to see large-scale change across the entire system with community energy demonstrating how things can be done, how in, uh, communities can be integrated, how consumers can, can be integrated. They can provide those tangible hooking points for the discourse to occur, that we are building an energy system that is fair um, and is, that works, but whether they will continue to provide a significant portion of the generation or of the tech or of the assets in that system, um, that might not be the case. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, just comment on the... Um, Ian's and Donald's questions, really, because I think they're related. Um, I mean, talking about other countries and the situation there, I mean, uh, Coalesce, the Coalesce project has been really interesting. We've got um, seven countries. So there's the UK, we've got Germany, Spain, Bulgaria, Italy, and um, Romania. And um, as you might guess, in the Eastern European countries, there's not a lot of community energy, although there is some, although they don't really recognise it as community energy. But out of the, the partners, they, they seem to view three of the, the partners in particular as being very successful when it comes to community energy in different ways. So the UK is seen as absolutely one of the more successful ones, Germany and Spain. Now in Spain, they've got a lot of sort of traditional energy co-ops which serve sort of outlying villages where, uh, you know, which are kind of off grid otherwise. So it's a particular kind of, of energy co-op. Um, in Germany, you know, they've, they've been very successful. The, um, you know, the, the legislation has favoured them there, just like it has in Denmark. We don't have Denmark, but, you know, Germany's in a, a sort of similar situation. Um, what we do find, though, is that because of this very specific sort of legislative framework in these, these, these different countries, there isn't necessarily uh, anything that you can just lift up and transfer to all of the partners, but part of the project is uh, a peer review process where you know, we identify best practice and see where it can be transferred. Now, one particular thing that came out of Germany was um, the idea of professionalization of the sector. Now, there are, there are some organizations there which have managed to achieve a scale. You know, um, They're not commercial energy companies, they're still co-ops. 
um, <laughs> but they have achieved a scale where they can start getting economies of scale, you know, that they're actually paying people. They're actually paying people. Um, <laughs> You know, they're, they're, they're that successful that they can actually employ people, although they still suffer from a lot of the, you know, the, uh, the problems that smaller organisations suffer from, you know, people get, you know, getting good at the job and then just moving on to a big energy company, that sort of thing. But, you know, I think that uh, professionalisation of the sector, I think that's quite relevant to our sector over here, uh, you know, which brings me on to Donald's question. Um, so, you know... Are we talking, when it comes to community energy, can, can it achieve scale? Is it about changing the, the conversation? Now, I, you know, personally, I think 170 megawatts is pretty damn impressive, you know. Okay, it might be a tiny part of the whole, but that is, you know, is serious amounts of power. Um, now, that has been achieved by a lot of voluntary groups. In Oldham, we do see, because we're a very poor borough, we see... Um, the development of uh, community energy as part of the wider low carbon sector is a key aim and an opportunity for our residents to gain training employment in this rapidly growing sector it's, it's definitely an opportunity and we've worked with uh, community energy england and, and a number of other stakeholders to develop the uk's very first community energy apprenticeship standard so we've developed a level four apprenticeship standard two-year apprenticeship standard that's now adopted at national level and um, we're working with uh, some organizations to put in place uh, endpoint assessments and that sort of thing so we believe that the the sector can be professionalized and um, that I think that that can lead to scale of delivery but I think the key thing that community energy has over everything else is that it can change the national conversation. And I think we're in a unique position at the moment. We've not only got, um, you know, we've got Extinction Rebellion, we've got Greta Thunberg, we've got all sorts of stuff going on. Um, David Attenborough, you know, he's obviously changed the conversation on single-use plastics. He's going to do it again on climate change. There's a lot of young people getting into this at the moment. Um, we've also got, you know, Nobody's mentioned it apart from Patrick earlier on, but we've got Brexit. Now, you know, I hate to say it, but this concept of taking back control is very, very appealing to a lot of people. And isn't community energy, energy doing just that? What could be better than a community owning the means of production of its own resources? There's, there's nothing that gives it more independence than that. And I think that this is a very, very potent mix. Um, you know, and I personally think that community energy has got a very long way to go you know, and a lot of potential yet. Thank you. Um, I will open it up for three more questions. Um, and we've got a lady there, a blonde lady there, and a lady at the back. Thank you. Um, I think we're all really good at talking about the positives, about promoting community energy, about decentralised renewables and so on. Um, but energy transformation is also about stopping doing things. Um, and, you know, I live in Cumbria where we've just approved the first new deep coal mine for 30 years. That's for steel, not power generation. Even so, we're digging more coal out the ground. And, and that was passed unanimously by councillors from the, uh, all three parties on the planning committee. So I wanted to ask the panel how we can begin to have a conversation with citizens about the things that we need to stop doing and how to support local areas who might otherwise lose from the energy transformation. The Smith, I'm the chair for uh, Coalition for Community Energy in Australia, and I'm really interested in the idea that um, what would happen if more money went through and resources went through to communities. And I love the idea of Oldham Council being the, let's not say backstop, but uh, something like that. Um, you know, fallback for for communities that are trying to do the right thing but obviously need some somewhere to, to fall back on and uh, probably with the perspective that local government plays a, a weaker role in Australia so our community energy sector is emerging more and just to quickly offer the perspective that one of the things community energy do, is doing is exploring the new, exploring the new landscape in ways and exploring new values that the commercial sector simply won't do. So um, that's a bit more than the national conversation. So, okay. And then finally, um, lady over there. Thank you. Uh, Raggy Lowe, I'm currently working independently. 
Um, I have a question which relates to the title of the panel session, Engaging Citizens and Consumers. So I wonder from the work um, that you're all involved in, um, what you feel people themselves um, understand by citizens or consumers as, as kind of labels for people. Um, how do they feel about their role? Is it as a citizen or is it as a consumer? Or sometimes is it both? And does it actually matter? Does that matter to people? Thank you. We deliberated a lot over the title, so it's quite good to have debate on that. Um, so, uh, again, I'll throw it open uh, to the whole panel, and we'll start at the far side and work back. Um, so, what about citizen engagement in things that we need to stop? And what about the citizens who will lose um, um, from the transition? Um, what if there was more money uh, channeled directly to communities? And, and how do people view themselves in, in the transition and, and uh, their, their role and the labels, and does it matter? We start with Andy. Okay, yeah, um, stopping coal, yeah, absolutely. I find it really interesting that at least a couple of the community energy movements or projects that I know of um, came out of uh, opposition to fracking. So there was, oh, I can't remember, there was the one down south, which is the original one, but the one in Salford certainly came out of it, you know. And, um, Ironically, Saddleworth Community Hydro, which we've got in Oldham, um, actually came out of opposition to a wind farm. Don't, don't talk about <laughs> You know, of course, there would have been megawatts of wind and there's, they've got 60 kilowatts of hydro. But anyway, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that um, for communities who want to reject something, there, there is a feeling that they need to be offering something positive instead, you know, and community energy is a great way for them to do that, you know. It's like, okay, we're against that, but we've, we're in favour of this. Um, you know, it seems to work for fracking. Um, whether it can work for coal, I don't know, but yeah. I'd, it, it could be a catalyst, I think. Um, the, um, okay, the, um, how do people feel about being citizens or consumers? Um, we've got a funny situation with community energy where um, a, a, a true co-op um, isn't allowed to be a community energy group. So, um, a, a, you know, a group can't produce energy and then sell it to its own members at present, you know, which is, just seems absolutely daft, really. Um, but, um, so, you know, people could be members of the co-op and consumers, you know, participating in that way. Um, you know, this, uh, consumer is such a sort of dry term, isn't it? I don't, I don't personally. Do you like being a consumer? I don't know, I don't know, not, I don't know, it's not really. A citizen, you know, comes with, it's, I think it comes with agency. You know, the implication that, you know, there's, you've got rights, you've got responsibilities, you've got the potential to do things. Um, in Coalesce, again, um, the term community energy doesn't mean anything in some of these countries. In Germany, they call it citizen energy. In Spain, they're calling it... Um, energy for people, by people, you know. So, yeah, I, it's, it, it, it's a really interesting one. Um, and it just, just the point about the public sector being a backstop for community energy, yeah, I, I think yeah, we're trying to expand it in Oldham to, um, you know, to include other, you know, even private sector partners. But I, I think if, you, if, if big, powerful organisations can almost provide the, 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 the a fertile ground for a community energy group to flourish without being so much under pressure, um, you know, that's that's the best thing that we can do for them. So, yeah, yeah sort of try and uh, dilute my notes. Um, so, in, in regards to stopping, I'm sorry, but the question here is it a matter of is it would you be able to expand a little bit more? My apologies, I, I still maybe I'm struggling to. Is it so the con, the concern? So we're still digging coal out of the ground to be able to. Get to steel. Is it a matter of communities still want their steel spoons and they still want their steel knives and they still want to move forward with that that kind of stuff? Or am I am I, am I completely missing the the bar there? I think. I mean, the point for me is that you know, if I mean, as in you know, deprived areas of the well, Cumbria and Oldham are two different deprived areas in the northwest that depend on the jobs that are available there, um, and if we start saying you can't have these high carbon jobs or, you know, we, we're going to stop doing what you depend on. I mean, you know, look back to the 80s and what happened when the coal mines closed then for very different reasons. Um, so it's, it's all very well having positive views about community energy, but 
how do we work with communities who might, for very valid reasons, be attached to a different energy vision? Mm, absolutely. So, I mean, certainly, I think potentially there, there, there could be sight of that transition already occurring to some degree um, in, in, in Scotland. Certainly, I know that kind of lots of communities come together there um, to... Uh, to you know, set up kind of to engage in kind of creating community revenue from the wind farms that they may have capacity to be able to set up and the co-ops they've engaged with. Um, I mean, potentially this would be an element for citizen advice, but thinking about how we get ahead of that, and I don't know whether this is a role for community energy or not, or maybe it's again it's a, it's a push like you could go on and do this. It's you know maybe is, is it are we looking at do we need to look at retraining? Do we need to look at um, you know be actively going out and seeking those people that maybe that have the potential for job loss, not just through you know needing to stop those elements but through greater automation, greater potential uh, changes in, in, in our manufacturing or other sectors. Um, beyond, beyond that, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure where community energy might be able to play a role. And again, I'm, I'm sure people will be able to, to jump in on that one. My apologies for needing the clarification. I was wondering sure I was trying to find something useful. Um, I think, yeah, I, I would completely agree in regards to um, consumers versus citizens. It, it almost goes and you jump from passive to, to, to active almost in, in that slight change of, of, of word. One, one thing I, I, I have found in, in, in my time, I've been very privileged to be able to go and talk to schools about how they're consuming energy and, and what they think about. And, and certainly it takes, it does take a, a, a in this case, an hour, hour session to be able to move students from secondary schools and primary schools from feeling like a consumer to a citizen. Um, you know, it takes a kind of a, a potentially quite a, you know, a drawn out, not a drawn out process, but a process to be able to make them realise that, oh, okay, I am responsible and active and engaged in my energy system in all of these ways. Um, so it's, although, although there absolutely needs to be potentially a differentiation and maybe more of a active use and more agency in, in the responsibility consumers or citizens have, however you choose to class them. Um, do we need to engage with and just commu can community energy provide more ways of engaging people in realising that they are citizens and not just consumers, that they have agency and activity to be able to offer? Um, I certainly think that it can. Um, how, how we continue to proliferate that, um, I'm sure is a matter for continued uh, discussion. I think I'm good though. Anyone else like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say a couple of things. Um, one, this idea about talking to people about what we need to stop doing, I think to some extent on a higher level, people are kind of on board with certain things, um, perhaps not, not totally, but the key issue obviously that you're alluding to here is jobs and, and sort of economic security and all of those things. And I actually quite like that link to the other question that was asked about what would happen if we give more resources to the community level. And actually, if you combine talking to those communities about change with more resources and can talk about what that future might be, which is a little bit... It's not exactly what's happening in South Wales at the moment with what Nick presented earlier uh, in terms of um, sort of, you know, the big steel... Um, there's the steel construction going on there and uh, changing the way the energy is pro provided, but also, you know, people do perceived threats to their jobs. And I think ultimately, being from Cardiff at the moment, coal, you know, going back into the coal mines isn't perceived as negatively as, as anywhere else in the country because it's associated with economic prosperity. So I, I think, you know, it's gonna be a, a difficult trade-off, but if you combine it with talking to people about what they value and what they want to see, and maybe even combine it with resources, and that doesn't necessarily have to be financial, well, it should probably be financial resources, but also giving them um, access to expertise and giving them confidence uh, that, you know, th their communities matter, then I think that would be really good. And I think you could have that conversation quite easily. Um, not easily, but easier than if you didn't. Um, the other thing I was going to say about this question about whether people see themselves as citizens or... A, uh, consumers, I think my, my immediate response is that it depends on how you engage them. Uh, I think to some extent, yes, people are used to being consumers as part of energy, but um, we, when I looked at, back at all of our transcripts that we've done over the projects, um, often people don't like the idea of energy as a commodity because they don't see it as something that you, know, you just competitively purchase in a market. It's something that you need in order to heat your home. So an there's an element that people don't like this idea of energy as a commodity, which is sort of against this idea of that they're just a consumer. Um, but that's what they're used to. Uh, we also have been quite successful at engaging people 
with the idea of uh, deliberating what kind of future we want, um, and that's kind of a more of a citizens' assembly type of engagement. So certainly, I think people are very open to that. Um, but then, what does even a citizen? You know, I mean, you talked about this. What does a citizen even mean? Uh, it, maybe it's changing. Maybe it's different in different contexts. Um, maybe the sort of social contract that people are having with other institutions of the state is changing, particularly when it comes to things like energy. Um, so I think it's a difficult question to answer, and I think I, I won't take up any more of your time, but it's a really interesting conversation. I think it's really, really important, particularly when we talk about getting people more involved in community energy or other things, or, you know, not just dumping responsibility on people, but giving them agency and confidence that they can do that. Yeah, so I want you to focus more on um, what would happy, happen if money went to um, uh, local authorities or if you had a sort of backstop um, for local authorities. So I think um, this uh, transformation of the energy market, um, one of the core risks here is that you do leave people behind. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, including whether they have the agency to have t certain technologies within their home, or whether they have the money to, to get those technologies, or what the market models look like, and how applicable those market models are for certain people. Uh, and it's quite possible there might be local issues, so um, you might have certain vectors that are only available in local areas for heating, for example, and that might affect market models and things like that. So I absolutely think it's necessary that there should be some sort of um, additional support if there are people <laughs> left behind, and that additional support could come from like a local authority or a local level. Um, or it could come in another form, um, but there does need to be that support there for those who are left behind. Um, on the question about citizens and consumers, for me it's very much about power dynamics. So um, if, if, it's, if a person is in a situation where they have um, a sort of asymmetric information or they have less knowledge, less, like, less uh, capacity or ability um, to do something, um, then often they will feel like a consumer and often they will need the protections that are associated with being a consumer. Um, and I think you could theoretically be a consumer within a community energy model um, just as much as you might be working with like a big six energy company. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about um, how much information you get and how powerful you feel in that situation for me. Fantastic, thank you. I think we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, one question here, any other last questions and one question in the middle, thank you. Uh, yeah, Keith Bell, University of Strathclyde. Um, <laughs> I think, Christine, I think you mentioned one of the things that the people you talked to uh, liked was self-sufficiency. Uh, so I just wondered what happens to everyone else when the people who can afford to be self-sufficient become self-sufficient? And one last question in the middle here. Hi, David Elms from Warwick Business School. Um, it's a question about sort of polls and surveys. As we've gone from sort of big energy to local energy, um, when we had big questions, we could do national surveys, national polls, and so on. Everything that you've said that says so far says, well, when you're looking local, it's very different. And so the question is, do we sort of know how to understand what people want in a local context, and do we have established... Uh, repeatable methods for doing that in a consistent way. Thank you. So again, tackle as much of this or as, as little as you like, but some, some concluding thoughts on, on um, self-sufficiency and, and distributional justice. So if, if some are self-sufficient and others aren't, what's the, what's the implications? And um, what, how do we understand public perceptions at a local scale? So we start this end. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, so the first one on self-sufficiency, I think you can see the immediate risks with someone becoming self-sufficient um, <laughs> and certain um, the way things are funded at the moment, so certain fuel poverty schemes like warm homes discount, um, eco, that, that kind of thing, um, they're all f funded through bills, through energy bills, so if someone becomes self-sufficient there is like an issue around um, uh, how you make sure that there's equity in who's paying for certain types of um, bill support. Um, 
on the polls and surveys question, do we understand um, what people want at a local level? Um, probably not. We're probably uh, not had the sort of research at a local level. And you can see how issues might be very, very different and how issues might change over time. Um, as well, so what might be true right now in a local area might be very different in the future as certain like um, issues emerge and um, certain climate change um, transformations um, happen to people. Um, so I'd say it's probably not, and probably something that we need more of a focus on. So the question about self-sufficiency and what happens to everyone else, I mean, I completely agree. Um, and I think when I talk about self-sufficiency, I, I think it's more of the abstract idea of self-sufficiency that people enjoy. But it can also be apl applied at different scales. So when you talk about energy security, this comes up about not, <coughs> not depending on energy imports and things like that. So I think, you know, it's played a big role in Brexit, taking back control, all of that stuff. I mean, it's just something that people feel positive about, I think, when they first think about it. But that doesn't mean, I think that people are aware of, well, not, and this is when they immediately bring up this sort of problem that, well, it's just for rich people who have time, who can afford to become self-sufficient. And most people that we've engaged, and this has been sort of hundreds of the different projects, I think know someone who, would, who already has problems, for example, paying for energy, or would have problems with these new ideas that we might put in front of them. So I think it's quite easy for people to understand or take the perspective of someone who might not be become self-sufficient. Now, whether that means that they don't think it should be an option for other people is a different thing. I mean, there's already unfairness in our system. I mean, the way that we currently pay for things is kind of quite regressive, you know, through, 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 through things on energy bills and things like that. So I think, you know, people are aware that not everything can be 100% equal, but that it should at least, you know, that when we kind of consider these things and when you know self-sufficiency is something that might be afforded by owning your own power power generation that we also think about well what happens to everyone else so i think i mean that's certainly something that is important and that people recognize that and the other thing i was going to say about national polls and how can we find out what people want <coughs> if everything becomes local i mean just a note of caution i don't think even national polls tell you that much i mean they tell you some things but you can over interpret them and often they are so, um, and also you can still do polls at a local level. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's a deeper question about methods and how we actually engage or enable people to, to engage with these issues. So, you know, but also include them in decision making, not that we get information from them and then someone else makes a decision. But I think it's about making the decision making more inclusive. Um, and that's a problem at national level and probably e easier at local level. Um, but I don't know the answer to that. It's just some other questions thrown back at you. Um, so in, in, in the self-sufficiency scenario, is, is this person completely private wire? I don't need the grid. I don't need anything. I'm just going to sit here with my wind turbine. It could be a person or it could be a community energy project. Okay. Um, so certainly, I mean, there's, there's potentially arg arguments around being able to, uh, if, 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 if that entire community went off, I imagine there's probably some arguments around, you know, having that connection to the grid being paid for to potentially deal with risk or deal with upset from a, from a consumer. Uh, beyond that, I wouldn't potentially be able to offer much more. And I, 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 I agree that there, there is a potential for, for kind of, we already have that regressive nature and, and we could be leaving people behind as we move on. But, um, you know, is, 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 there, is, is there want enough for that self-sufficiency? That's, that's maybe an ask for the panel and the rest. Is that something that we're seeing more and more communities want to get to and, and leave everyone else behind. I guess maybe that's something to, to, to discuss more. Um, so my apologies again, I throw some more questions back. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, and potentially in regards to national polls, I was talking about community energy as a potential hooking points and maybe they can, maybe maybe that's a role they could start to play. You know, if, if you need to go and have a look at what do X um, 100 communities with access to decentralized energy want to see and how would they vary? Let's go and find those community energy organisations that are embedded in those communities that can ha help facilitate those polls um, and engage with that community and, and hopefully show enough of respect and variety to be able to tailor the energy system or to allow a flexibility of the energy system that may um, be able to deal with that, you know, that, the, that, the potential invariances that the national context has when it becomes uh, to centralised or decentralised. Um, I hope that's a role that it can play and I, you'll agree it could play. Um, but yeah, I, I think 
think that's my, my piece on that one. Okay, on the self-sufficiency, yeah, I think absolutely bang on. Um, I think it all boils down to who pays for the grid. So, um, yeah, um, it's interesting in, um, in Greater Manchester at the moment, um, our local DNO, Electricity Northwest, they've been having this, these thoughts. They've been like, oh, you know, flipping heck, everybody's installing private wire, you know. Um, what's going to happen to our grid? You know, who's going to pay for it? So they, they come up with a scheme that they call virtual private wire. And they're trying to get a derogation from Ofgem to actually test this. And the, the idea is that um, if you've got, a, like, I don't know, a solar array or something and you want to supply a building that's on, just on the local substation, it's not very far away, then they can charge you a reduced rate to do that. So, uh, you know, trying to stop people from installing their own private wire, basically, and, and making the local, you know, the, the DNO grid redundant. But, of course, you know, if you start charging people less for these virtual private wire arrangements, then the people that aren't using those arrangements are going to end up paying more. And, and it's the same with, you know, yeah, people that can't afford solar panels, you know, people in fuel poverty, you know, they're going to end up paying the price of the grid, which people going off grid are no longer paying. So, yeah, it does beg the question, well, who's going to pay for the grid? Is it going to be a case of, I mean, in Germany, um, you know, some communities have actually bought their local grid. They've, uh, you know, the whole cities that now own their own grid municipally. Um, you know, is it a case of local authorities buying the grid? Is it a case of the grid being paid for by through national taxation. Um, you know, I think it's a really good point, you know, and I think that this is definitely coming down the line. Um, on um, local context, yeah, I think absolutely bang on again, really, and I, but I think um, local authorities have a key role to play here. So, um, you know, it was interesting this morning, you know, heard from, um, you know, heard from Oxford, and the, sort of, you know, they're interested in the co-benefits to, you know, decarbonisation. Well, in Oldham, we can't afford to just be interested in things. If we're going to, you know, dis have discretionary spend on low carbon, you know, it has to be in the context of our local priorities. You know, it has to directly relate to, I don't know, creating jobs, creating employment, um, you know, um, maybe, uh, you know, another environmental project might create um, an opportunity opportunity for social prescribing, care farming, this sort of thing, you know, we've got mental health issues, physical health issues. So we, we cannot do uh, low carbon projects in isolation. They have to be linked to local priorities. Um, we, we're a cooperative council. We're one of uh, a number of councils in the Cooperative Council's Innovation Network, and we have a cooperative model by which the, uh, the council uh, runs, and it has three pillars. One is thriving communities, which is all about communities having everything that they need in terms of their, their needs, their disadvantages. One is inclusive economy. You know, again, it's, you know, there's an opportunity uh, for, for communities to own their own energy production, um, you know, to participate in the, you know, jobs training. And cooperative services, which is really about public sector reform. And that's about doing things in a different way to, to get more social value, you know, to enable people to participate. So it's not the council just pays to put solar panels on. It's like the community can do it, do it itself and we can support them to do it. And I think local authorities are the key there to knowing what their local communities actually need and making sure that low carbon projects and programs are fundamentally linked into those priorities and deliver across the whole range of uh, social value. Well, thank you very much uh, to our panellists. Um, I just think that's a really broad discussion. Um, thinking about what, what consumers and citizens are and how careful we have to be about treating them as, as one um, and how we engage them um, can affect their, their view and their role in the system. And really thinking about the profound implications that energy transformation is going to have on citizens and, and the, the, the sort of spectrum of forms of engagement and the spectrum of benefits um, that might, might come from it. Um, but I think, I think the thing that, that's, that's struck me most about the, the discussion is how frequently justice has come up. Um, and the, the not leaving people behind through this. So treating, not just dealing with, with citizens who can engage, but thinking about all citizens and, and involvement and, and how they might benefit from it. Um, so I just would like to, to thank our, our panellists once again for a really interesting uh, debate. Thank you. <laughs>
So before you all disperse, just a reminder that in an hour we have our poster session, Local Energy in Action. That's back over in the Ruth Deach building, starting at 6.30 uh, until 8, uh, just before dinner. Um, all of the posters, um, including one that Andy mentioned, are going to be uh, spoken to in, in turn. So please do come for as much of that as you can and, and hear from the, I think we've got six, at least six exhibitors of posters, um, mainly from local authorities and a couple of universities and other um, um, organisations, so that emphasis on, on, on action will continue in that session. So I'll see you all there. Thank you.